Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee in 2022. Um, before we begin, can I ask all those uh, members present using electronic devices to please uh, switch them to silent? Our first item of business this morning is a round table session on inshore fisheries. Uh, and as you will have seen from the brief uh, circulated for this meeting, we intend to, to cover four broad themes, uh, and each uh, taking about 30 minutes uh, to cover, and, and we were due to finish around about 12 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, I know we won't get everything covered today, but it will certainly give us a, a, a taster of, of the issues, and at some point over the course of this uh, parliamentary session, uh, we'll no doubt uh, explore some of the issues uh, in greater depth. So if we keep uh, the questions uh, and answers as succinct as possible to, to allow everybody the maximum opportunity to contribute. Um, so before we uh, get started, uh, I think it would be a good idea to go around the, the table and just for everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, and if you just keep it to your, to your, your name and the organisation that you're, you're representing, that would be helpful. So I'm Fernie Carson, the convener of the, the committee. Do I need to press the uh, no. Uh, you don't need to operate the mics. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, I'm uh, uh, Lucy Kay. I'm the Marine Protected Area Project Officer with the Community of Aran Seabed Trust. I'm here representing the Coastal Communities Network. Beatrice Wishart, MSP for Shetland and Deputy Convener of this committee. Good morning. Sheila Keith from the Shetland Fishermen's Association. Good morning. Jim Fairley, MSP for Persia South and Kenosha. Good morning. Charles Miller. Executive Director of the Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust. Good morning, Rachel Hamilton, MSP for Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire. Good morning, Jenny Minto, MSP for Argyll and Butte. Good morning, Alistair Bally, Philp, Scottish Crew Fishermen's Federation. Good morning, Hannah Fennell, Head of Orkney Fisheries Association and Vice President to Scottish Fishermen's Federation. Good morning, uh, Phil Taylor, Open Seas. Good morning, I'm Mercedes and I represent the North East region. Morning, I'm Elaine White and I work with the Clyde Fishermen's Association and I'm here in the capacity of the Communities um, CIFA, Community Central Fisheries Alliance. Good morning, Karen Adam, MSP for Bampshire and Bucking Coast. Good morning, I'm Simon MacDonald, I'm Chairman of West Coast Regional Inshore Fisheries Group. Alistair Allen, MSP for the Hayland and the Year. Uh, good morning, Callum Duncan. I'm Head of Conservation Scotland for the Marine Conservation Society. Good morning. I'm Ariane Burgess, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. You're all most welcome. And uh, we'll get straight into it. Uh, and the first theme is uh, to explore fishing industry pressures and ask Alistair to kick off. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I hesitate to, to list the pressures that uh, the fishing industry may feel uh, under, but obviously some of those may be the result of, or are the result of, of the deliberate policy around Brexit, but uh, others are, are, I'm quite sure that we've had brought to us recently, or those of us who represent fishing constituencies are well aware of, are around fuel costs and labour shortages, issues around visas. Uh, rather than put any more words in your mouth, I wonder if, if people want to say something about the kinds of pressures that uh, exist um, uh, in the time we're living through on the fishing industry. Just before we get someone to answer that, my sincere apologies, uh, despite the fact that you're right in front of me, uh, Fiona, I, I, I failed to bring you in to introduce yourself. My apologies. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, no worries. Uh, Fiona Reid, uh, Wayne of Open Conservation. OK, thank you. Um, anybody would like to kick off on Alistair's question? Yeah. Um, I think that fisheries are facing increased pressures from many areas. Their list is very lengthy, um, whether that be from um, new developments coming into the waters, whether it be from um, lack of science to back up arguments that come from ENGOs. Um, I think the regulatory authorities um, are also causing pressures, um, and it's we. It's something that we need to tackle. Um, I think the Scottish Government need to be very clear on the resources that they can deliver um, and be transparent on that. Because if we can't um, be able to fight our case of why we are a sustainable fisheries, then we are going to always be under attack. And the transparency of delivery um, under the pressures that the Scottish Government currently has um, with the increased workload that you have to deliver 
um, for us to be at the, the end of being open to criticism through lack of science, for example, is going to continue. Okay, thank you. We're certainly going to move on to the science uh, theme a little bit later. Simon. Yes, the, uh, I mean, I see the, the two major factors affecting the fishing industry just now uh, as being spatial squeeze as probably number one, but almost first equal has got to be the, the issue over uh, the, 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 the visa situation for crew. But spatial squeeze, I mean, we, we, we're having uh, more and more offshore renewable uh, projects going on with very great lack of consultation with the industry. So valuable, valuable fishing ground is being taken up with the, uh, with, with the farms without consulting the fishermen. And I mean, the fishermen would be quite willing to say, well, there's a better space over here, uh, you know, which is fine because it's, it's not fishable uh, or it's not affecting spawning grounds because of, you know, there, there is cases of um, projects and developments being put where there's you know, important haddock spawning grounds. So that, to my mind, is a major, major issue with a long-term effect. Okay, um, Elaine White. Yeah, um, I think the main issue facing fishing, particularly inshore fishing, is nuance, um, because I think it's a lack of understanding. I've mean, I seen a campaign just the other week that said um, we, we should be banning industrial fishing, and that includes all fishing, um, you know, uh, that, that's mobile. And I think that there has to be an understanding that a Chinese, you know, potentially a Chinese industrial fishing boat is not similar to a 10-metre trawler. Um, and I had a quick look over some of the briefings as well. Um, I, I noticed in the SPICE briefing it said that the, some of the mobile boats could go offshore. Well, some of the mobile boats that we represent are under 10 metres, are, are quite small, 14 potentially. So that option to go offshore is, is not really... It's not really the case. It's not as simple as one, you know, one and one. We represent all types of boats. And I, I did notice as well in the stats, it said from 2017 to 2021, that we'd lost 12 over 10 mobile uh, fishing boats. We haven't. We've lost about 48 by our, our manners. But when you look at how the, the licences go, even more if you take that, that spell a bit, bit higher. Skilled workers, I also noticed that it said that it costs um, a few thousand pounds to bring people in. There was an example from a Welsh fisherman who tried to bring some skilled workers in and it cost him over £40,000 and took over five months to get any labour. And these are in issues where depopulation and local labour are a major issue. So it's understanding the nuance that the figures might not be quite what you think they are. And I also think there's a real issue of communication between people um, and, and, and hyperboil in a sense. We need to sit down and talk about things because I, I think when we're talking about, you know, 95% of an area is fished, and when you looked at it, it's maybe 13%, maybe even less than that is possible for fishing. It's the nuance that we need to get down to, and I think that's what we're here to discuss today. Thank you. Hey, Hannah. Um, yeah, I think, I, th I think Elaine's right. There's a lot of issues facing the inshore. We've got these economic issues, social issues, and issues with our management as well. I think a lot of the issues facing the inshore might not be specific to just fishing, labour, the cost of fuel, things like that. But because often inshore works in these remoter areas, these are acute pressures. Inshore also struggles because these are small businesses we're talking about. They're one or two individuals, they're sole traders or their partnerships. They don't have a lot of resources to fall back on. So over the years, this lack of resilience has really corroded the industry. And I think what exacerbates it further is the current management system we have for inshore fishing. It doesn't allow for much flexibility. So, for example, in Orkney, our fishers really struggle because we are essentially a mono fishery. We can only fish for crab and lobster. So when COVID happened and when Brexit affected the markets, we couldn't pivot to anything else. And that's just because how the management structure works. And that, I think, exacerbates the pressures we already face. OK. I'm going to bring in Rachel <coughs> Hamilton. It was just a to Simon's um, point there about spatial planning. Um, the, the briefing says that obviously there was a, um, some sort of report done which stated that by 2050 um, the pressures could be you know, almost half um, in terms of the, the reducing the, the ability to fish. So I'm, I wanted to ask you, do you believe that if you've seen it, that that spatial plan was sufficient? Do you think that, that that was meaningful? What more would you like to see in terms of the pressures that you're facing? I think, I think it's very important that uh, the, the fishing industry is actually brought in as a statutory consultee 
on the uh, the, on, on, on the, the applications for uh, renewable energy projects, because as I, I said earlier, that it is uh, the fishermen know the ground, they know where the spawning areas are, they know the traditional and, and viable fishing grounds, and it's almost at the stage now where we're getting a lot of demand from people saying, well. We've got HPMAs, we've got MPAs, we've got uh, renewable sites, which once they're there, they're there forevermore. So uh, should we not be looking at having uh, protected fishing areas where you know, there's historical viable fishing ground? Um, Phil. Thanks very much. Um, I would say on that report, there's, there's fundamental errors with that report. It makes assumptions that are frankly not correct. So one of them, it assumes that there will be no fishing in 80% of marine protected areas. That's something that you know isn't on the table, as far as I'm aware, in those negotiations. Uh, I think the highest scenario presumes a, a 50 meter, uh, sorry, a, a 0.5 nautical mile buffer around all cabling. And sadly, as as we've seen in Shetland recently, that that's not the case. You know, so there's there's fundamental errors with that. But I I think that the premise of it is really important. Um, you know, the, the note that there's a need to ensure that our seas are properly spatially managed. Now, of course, that's something that this Parliament uh, asked of the Scottish Government through the Marine Scotland Act uh, to develop a national marine plan. Now, one was developed, one was published through public consultation, through engagement with ourselves as stakeholders uh, in this room in 2015. Um, if you look at the fisheries chapter of that, frankly, most of it's being ignored. Um, frankly, most of it's uh, being actively opposed. So it says, you know, th th there's a commitment to ensure that the landings obligation is complied with. The committee will be aware that that's something that I and my organisation have been concerned the Scottish Government's future catching policy is actively trying to undo. Um, so what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that I agree that there is a need for a I agree with the premise of that report. That there's an, a better need for spatial management of our sea. And fishing needs to be an integral part of that. We need to have those discussions, including you know, many of the things that Simon said that I agree with, uh, protecting spawning grounds, identifying areas which should be prioritised for fish catching. You know, what we've termed go fish zones in the past. These are good things. And hopefully something that you know, this, we can make progress on in discussions like this. Thank you. Mihana. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, that report was published by Scottish Fishermen's Federation and the NFFO, and it ran through a number of different scenarios. The 50% was the worst case scenario. But I do agree with you, Phil. I think the, thing, the reason we published that report is because no one else was looking into the cumulative impact assessments of all these different industries. And in the absence of government stepping forward and doing that work and researching it, industry had to fill that gap. So there is a lot more work to be done, and we'd love to see it done, and we'd love to see the Scottish government be the ones to bring that forwards. Okay, Sheila. As Mark explained, there were various scenarios presented in that report, and I think taking little snippets out of it, maybe taking it out of context, um, but what it did point out was that the spatial squeeze from everything from uh, MPAs, HPMAs, uh, offshore wind, cabling, etc., etc., the pressure on fishing, um, which is a sustainable food source when managed properly, and which many of our, our grounds are actually managed sustainably, um, uh, is ultimately people who will have to eat something else will have, which will have a different, a higher a carbon output. So it goes against the grain to, to push fishermen off the of grounds where they can fish productively. Um, and not only do fishermen know where they fish, also the Scottish Government does. And there, 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 there's plenty of data that shows where the productive fishing grounds are and it's very irresponsible to give an option uh, for development to wind farm developers in those areas and also in nursery grounds and spawning areas as well. If you fish, fish will be affected by noise, by electric magnetic fields from cabling that are all associated with this. The stage we are now at with all of this proliferation of uh, offshore wind is very, very concerning to fishery. It's actually very irresponsible, the, the route that the government is currently going on this. And it seems to be that fishermen do not have a voice. We are dismissed. We are met with disdain by developers who have been given us options appraisal to, or, or options to build it, 
a, a wind farm, they meet us and go, well, hold on a minute, why, why have I been given this area if you, if you fish here? Surely that should have been protected. And we are left, organisations that are very, very busy, under-resourced, to fight fishermen's case when it should have been that the Scottish Government protected fishing in the first place. That needs to be addressed and fixed before damage is done irreparably to fishing. Um, the, the, and also taking um, all the socio-economic benefits that come from fishing into the rural areas of Scotland, not only the sustainable element of that, but you can't ignore if you, dismiss, if you, get, if you damage fishing, you also damage, damage rural communities, which are very vulnerable to trying to find something else to do. OK, thanks. Uh, Lucy. Thank you. I think a point that I'd like to raise from the Coastal Communities Network is that in terms of spatial measures, we're really concerned about some of the narrative around marine protected areas um, and that they are, to all intents and purposes, essentially dealt with in policy and decision making um, as just about biodiversity and are also being presented as a, as a detriment to fisheries and sustainable use of natural resources. Marine biodiversity underpins ecosystem function, which underpins fisheries. And many of the habitats within marine protected areas, they provide an essential role in the life cycle of different fish and shellfish species, you know, from the larval stages through to nursery and feeding areas. So we feel it's very short-sighted that marine protected areas are not seen for what they are, which is essentially a spatial management tool that can help us actually deal with issues facing the, the state of Scotland's inshore waters. Many fisheries can take place within marine protected areas um, and actually benefit from that because the areas can be more productive if seabeds recover uh, and people feel that their fisheries are protected. So we would like to just raise that concern with the committee. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in one or two more stakeholders and then move back to members. So, Alistair. Yeah, yeah briefly. Uh, oh, sorry. Another Alistair, sorry. Beg your pardon. Sorry. Another Alistair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like, just like to say we concur with, with most of the people that have brought up um, spatial squeeze as one of the biggest issues facing the, the industry. But I'd like to point out that what that actually means, because it's a euphemism really for consolidating effort into ever-decreasing space, and that means that we're driving fisheries towards unsustainability and we're creating gear conflict by squeezing more and more effort into, into an ever-decreasing space. And one of the key issues here is that we don't have inshore fisheries management plans, which to, in my mind is quite shocking. Um, we don't have individual species management plans for most of our shellfish stocks, and we don't have area-based management plans for, for our regions or even more localised fisheries like sea locks. Even, even the Clyde doesn't have a fisheries management plan. And if we had a fisheries management plan, develop them, and we look to try and optimise the social economic and environmental performance of our fisheries, we would be able to get a, a steer for where we should be heading and how we should mitigate any, any given spatial pressure. Um, but without those fisheries management plans, we're kind of just fumbling about in the dark and everybody's fighting over the remaining space. So I would say development of area-based fisheries management plans has got to be one of the key priorities in inshore fisheries management. Uh, Elaine. Just to, to, to add to that, I mean, I think for inshore communities, it's particularly um, prominent that we, we don't only have the renewables to think about. We have aquaculture, we have navy, we have cables, we have you know the, the various um, protection designations as well. And I think I don't know many fishermen who don't think sensible, evidenced, and monitored protection is a good idea for where it's required. I think the issue that we have, and I've said it in my evidence, is that the, for the last MPAs, we haven't had that monitoring program that we said we would have. And I think that's important because you may be closing off an area and not doing too much good. It might be the area next to it that, that, that is more sensible to close. But without that baseline monitoring, we might have, we might have issues. And just to go back on the, the, the narrative uh, or the, the message about MPAs, etc. I mean, we see the narrative that's coming out of Lindisfarne right now where we've displaced not only mobile fishermen but scallop fishermen. Um, certainly in the Clyde, um, which is mentioned 20, over 20 times in the papers submitted to this, this committee, which is, um, you know, in comparison to the North Sea, that's five, mentioned five times. We have some areas that are getting a lot of pressure, and we need to look at what's happening here and what, what people understand MPAs, etc., to be. Because if you're understanding them as a tool just to manage fisheries, rather than actually a tool to manage a specialist feature and be monitored to make sure it's doing that job, then you're maybe not quite understanding why we need them. And I think that's the issue. We've seen it with the COD box as well. 
Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to ask the committee members to, to ask their questions. I've, I've got three committee members, so maybe if we ask them all together, the, the, the stakeholders can address them all together, if you like. So, Jenny, uh, Ariane and Alistair, please. Thank you, convener, and um, bless you, Dr Allen. Um, I, I'd like to return to uh, points that I think Simon, Elaine and Hannah raised about um, lack of um, employees, lack of available uh, workers in the fishing industry, and if you could perhaps um, expand a bit more uh, on the points that you made around visas and such like. Alistair. <coughs> Thank you, uh, convener. Excuse me, my sneezes are a source of renewable energy. <laughs> Um, uh, Elaine White mentioned there uh, briefly, um, you touched on the issue of visas, and I was just curious to know whether you or anyone else me, wanted to say a little bit more about that, given the, the workforce pressures that fishing faces and the difficulties that there must be associated, well I know from my constituency experience, are associated with uh, not easily being able to obtain visas for people from outside the EU in particular. For asking. Absolutely. We, we are facing real pressures with workforce, and I think with there's issues of depopulation, it becomes even more prevalent. Um, certainly, I know in Argyllus areas where it's 16 per cent depopulation, just the same in the Western Isles, which, who we are also representing today, um, we, we have very similar issues. I think I have uh, no members who have taken about eight months to go through this process, and they still don't have any workers. And as I said, the Welsh example of actually successfully getting there cost over £40,000. £20,000 alone um, in lawyers' fees. Um, I think what we need is a fair system, and I appreciate that the Scottish Government put forward a rural pilot visa scheme, which, which, which was very much appreciated. However, obviously, it's a UK Government devolved issue, and we're, we're really struggling to, to get a change in any kind of policy. Um, we, uh, we've seen areas that have had all of their workers sent home, and, and also um, Brexit obviously meant that a lot of our Eastern European skippers were sent home as well. So that caused further dis uh, you know, destabilisation. So we are all about training domestic people where they are available and that's very important that we do that but also we have there has to be a recognition if if you have a business cutting hair but you had no hairdresser for eight months how would you survive and we need to start understanding it in those terms it's a safety issue too jim would you like to come out on that topic yeah. briefly elaine you just mentioned twenty thousand pounds in lawyers fees can you explain that please and, um, because it's a very complicated process in terms of the, the application process. Actually, you, you do it, it goes into the EFER, and you have to ask very specific questions about your business. It's very complicated. Um, it might be something that big, large hotel chains can do with an HR department, but if you're operating a, a three-man fishing boat, it's a very difficult thing to do. You have to outsource it to someone who can do the job. So you need lawyers to make your applications for your visas? Basically, and it's so time-consuming as well that, that, that you need someone on it all the time. Uh, Phil, were you wanted to come in on visas, or was it a different topic? It was a different topic. I can't come in on visas. Well, can I, can I ask Hannah to come in, because I think you had a comment on this, this topic, then I'll, I'll uh, bring Phil in and Ariane. Thank, yeah, it was just a couple of other points to supplement <coughs> Elaine's about workers. So the, fish, the inshore fishing industry, it's not just the workers at sea that we're struggling with, but it's the onshore processing side of things as well. Um, and I think a lot of that was to do with Brexit and the loss of EU labour. Um, in Orkney, our crab factory, which supplies to Marks and Spencers and Waitrose, it's really heavily reliant on the um, workers, obviously, but it's really struggling to actually meet its demands, and we've got real concerns about its future because of that. On the um, boat side of things, I think one big issue is that we do struggle to attract domestic crew for the inshore, and I think a part of that is because people are uncertain about what the future for the inshore is. We have people that want to go to sea, we see people going into aquaculture, we see people working on pilot boats, we see people working in these maritime industries, but they're not entering the fishing industry because they don't see what the future is. There's so much uncertainty right now that they're not wanting to enter it, and that's a huge concern as well. Um, we also have concerns about the foreign crew and the visas. Um, I think we've all seen the reports in the news about bad working conditions. I want to say that the industry strongly condemns any of that behaviour and we really want to have a system where people cannot abuse it and they cannot abuse their workers. And I think the issue there as well is that the skilled worker visa is so hard to get. Our fishermen in Orkney have been using the same foreign crew for over seven years now. They work with them really well. If we could get them on a skilled visa, we would have done so already. We really value them and the only reason they're still on these 
unsuitable visas is because we just cannot do it because of cost and because the system, it seems like it's designed to fail. Thank you. It's just staying on the workers' uh, topic. I'm going to bring in Lucy and then Alistair. I was actually wanted to just talk more about resilience as an issue facing the industry. I don't know if that's appropriate now. OK, well, Alistair, would you just, on, on workers specifically, we'll bring Alistair in and bring you in, Lucy. Yeah, I think it should be worth noting that in the smallest boats, um, there's very little reliance on foreign um, labour. Um, most of the smallest boats are one or two man boats, so obviously the owners are, are normally natives, um, and, uh, and then they only have to find one crew. And although the working conditions may be worse in the sense that there tends to be no toilets or showers in the smallest boats, the, uh, the, the, the ability to return home most nights to your home port and uh, be home for your tea, and also to be in a more sustainable and, and um, what's the word, um, reliable, you know, a, a, an industry that looks like it's got a bit of a future tends to be more attractive to bring people in. So. I think if, if we're going to discuss the labour issues in the fishing industry, we should understand that it's not equal across the whole spectrum and, the, and that the smallest and, and, uh, and, and more usually the static gear boats don't tend to use foreign labour. OK. And you can bring Sheila and then Lucy. Um, whilst I um, have great sympathy for colleagues all around Scotland who face this issue of, of getting foreign labour in and visas, in Shetland we have a a completely different situation. 100% of our inshore fishermen are resident in the islands. But it's something that we can't get complacent about because um, we are finding that a concern with implementation of government policy, attacks from ENGOs, which are not scientifically based, they're making um, statements about fishermen that are just blatantly not true, but the public tend to, to believe it. The issue of special squeeze, REM, which tax and traces fishermen like criminals, um, a fear of non compliance for filling out complicated uh, paperwork, all comes together to disincentivise the local people to join fishing boats because it makes them very uncomfortable to, while they're shopping, have members of the public attacking them, going, What do you think you're doing? When actually in Shetland we have the most sustainable inshore fisheries backed by science, which, if we get the opportunity later, I can explain what, how we got to that. Um, but in Shetland it is a different scenario, but we can't afford complacency. We need to be doing things in schools to encourage people to make sure that this is, but also government policy can't undermine what we try to do within our local communities. Okay. Um, Lucy. Thanks very much. Uh, um, just for the net, we wanted to make a point about the fact that um, the initial fisheries are dependent on a very small number of target species at the moment. So there are sort of species and stocks of fish and shellfish that used to exist, that used to be exploited and, and support businesses that now no longer exist. And there's been a consequent loss uh, of jobs and you know, the value of those fisheries as a result of that. So we're particularly concerned about this because we feel that this doesn't give a strong basis for developing sustainable marine-based activities related to fisheries. And we feel this is one of the issues that really we'd like to see being addressed. OK. Uh, I'm going to bring in Ariane and then uh, Karen. <coughs> Actually, um, the issue of labour was covered. The lo I was curious about local labour. That's been covered. Thank you. OK. Um, thanks. Uh, Karen. I was just going to come in on the labour aspect as well, and in regards to the visas, if there was any preemption that this was going to be an issue, and was there any, you know, um, any help or support offered in regards to that, and is there anything at the moment? Is that is that for local crew or for the foreign for crew? foreign for crew, foreign yeah. crew? Um, it's been an issue since I started working with the fishing industry in 2016, so it's been a long-standing issue. Um, I think it's been exasperated in recent years or really come to the fore because of the um, current UK government's stance on immigration, which I think might have exacerbated it. But it's, we've been fighting to make the skilled worker visa system workable for fishing vessels for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. So in Orkney and in Shetland, Alistair Carmichael and Lee MacArthur have been really supportive in helping us. And I'm sure Elaine as well can speak a bit more because she's been working really hard um, on behalf of CIFA for... Um, taking this issue forwards. Elaine? Okay. Yep, happy to, to, to pick up on that. Yeah, I mean, we've been working with DEFRA as well, and I think that there's, that they, there's a real will there to try and get something that's workable. However, obviously, it's home office policy, and it, it's how we link those things up. In terms of support for, um, <clears throat> well, obviously, the Scottish Government are looking at resettlement schemes, and they're looking, they looked at the rural pilot, so that is support. 
Um, but in terms of how it's practically trickling down in time, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's very concerning the number of boats. And I think what I should point out is that this is a regional thing. As, as Sheila pointed out, it's maybe not an issue so much in Shetland at the moment, but certainly it's not an issue in areas like Northern Ireland. Um, and, and we really have to address that because we're regionally imbalanced. So, okay, just to, to conclude this, this theme, I'm going to bring in Jim and then Mercedes. Yeah, three of the members, um, Hannah, Alistair and I think Sheila, have all talked about the desire to be a fisherman or wanting to go into the industry uh, because of the prospects, long-term prospects, all the rest of it. My understanding is I, I know nothing about fishing to the level that you guys clearly do. My understanding is that f fisher folk go out on boats and get a share of the catch. And if it's a, a high value catch, then they all do very well out of it. And all my uh, communication with fishermen has always been that it's a good, viable way to make a living. So why is there people in our country who are saying fishing is no for me? Is it because of the, the demonization? Is it because there is no money in it? Is it because you don't see a future? And I think that's really important getting down into that. I'll start with Sheila, Alistair, Eileen. I, th I think there's a, there's a risk of um, lack of science, the back evidence that you are running a sustainable fishery to avoid um, people demonising fishermen as being greedy people. Um, there's lack of quota in some areas, although it's also infrastructure. Quota, fishing effort itself does not solve issues. We, present, we developed this paper in Shetland, um, Rebuilding Scottish Inshore Fisheries, which shows that it's not just fishing effort, it's um, fish buyers, it's infrastructure, everything else that comes with that. Having fish, a fisherman can land fish on a pier, but if there's nobody to buy it or nobody to transport it, you don't have a... So it's some rural areas where that's been lost, that you may have somebody that wants to go and catch fish in that area, but because of the lack of infrastructure to back it up, that's been lost over time. All that needs to be rebuilt again in some rural areas. Um, I'll let other, other people speak as to why, but some, sometimes it is because of uh, the science that backs up um, sustainability. Hey, Alistair. To say much of fishing is not sustainable. I mean, the Scottish Government's own um, research claims that. Um, so I think a lot of people know that particular areas of the fishing industry aren't sustainable and don't have a long-term future, so you would be mad or desperate to go there. Um, I think a lot of it isn't profitable, and many sectors of the fishing industry are becoming less profitable. With the price of fuel at the moment, I think a latest Sea Fish report showed that much of the inshore mobile gear sector was not profitable if the price of fuel stays the way it is. Um, and the income isn't reliable, and in this day and age, people need a reliable income, um, more so than they maybe did historically. And, and the money's just not in it. I mean, when, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, we could, we could easily earn £100 a day, £600 a week, £800 a week. That was a good chunk of money 30-odd years ago. We're still earning similar wages now. And if that's not a consistent income, it can be very, very hard to make a living at the fishing industry. You've got to be keen, passionate or desperate, I think, if you want to be a fisherman in this day and age. And then you've got to choose very carefully what sector you go into. You've got to try and find one with a future. And, and at the moment, there's not very many sectors of the fishing industry looking like they have a tenable, well, in the inshore sector, looking like they have a tenable future, apart from maybe some of the static gear sector. I'm going to bring in Elaine and then Hannah and Phil, but just conscious of the time, we're, we're, we're running over already. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we um, submitted through the Trust, uh, I think, a, a vision for, for what the Clyde fishery looks like. And we really have to start doing that regionally for every area, I think, because every area is, area is slightly different. But in terms of demonisation, yes, that is a thing. Um, but even a point, a practical point, I mean, you had a young fisherman who went to a bank and he said he would like to get a loan for a slightly bigger boat, slightly bigger, he's under, under 10. And they said, but what about the closures that you, you have? What about you know, these MPAs? What about... So I think the perception that's coming through to the public is that, the, you know, that this is something that's wrong. Um, and you don't have that in a country like Norway. And I think Sheila is right. If we had sustainable science that was neutral, which is the key point, it has to be neutral, we could actually say to people, that here's a, a key path of progression. And, and, and I Can think, I ask you, yeah. what do you mean neutral? Who's producing science mm -hmm. that isn't neutral? Personally, I think any, any, anything should go through the government. I think that, personally, because it's a, an honest broker, or should be an honest broker. 
um, because I think we can all go away and do scientific studies, and without having um, the government's approval of that or involvement of that in some way, in some way, we, we can have people making all sorts of claims that are quite cherry picked, and that that is a, a massive issue. It's a massive issue. Who is producing science that is? Um, no, we don't have. We'll, 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 we'll pick these up in other themes. Um, uh, Phil, briefly, and Hannah, please. Really briefly, then, Jim was asking about opportunity. It's worth noting that the government already has duties within the UK Fisheries Act to uh, distribute opportunity in ways that deliver best social, economic and environmental outcomes. Now, the current rules for distributing quota are really the only ones that exist in that way. And as Hannah's already said, those can sometimes lead inshore fisheries to be without. Um, the, the mechanism, the legal requirement for a mechanism to be there to create those opportunities and to, to address some of these economic social issues, issues of resilience that Lucy, Lucy mentioned, but also environmental ones, which are my core interest, are there but are not being delivered. I would ask that the committee scrutinise that better, you know, more, more intensely, sorry. Okay. Hannah. Um, I just want to say that getting people into the fishing industry isn't, is actually fairly easy because, as I say, people do want to go to sea and work at sea. It's keeping them in the industry, and that can be for a number of things. It could be for the prices. It can be for the lack of opportunity. Um, so it's not just it's not getting people in the door that's the challenge. It's retaining them, and that's due to a number of factors that I think have already been highlighted by people here. Okay, thank you. Um, Mercedes, just a brief question to round us up. It's not brief, so... OK. Uh, fire away with your question, and then we'll decide whether we've got time to do okay. that. So just following on from discussion about um, development of a skilled worker visa and difficulties surrounding that, um, and then thinking about comments about local workforce um, challenges, I was wondering if there's potential to develop a, a, a skills pathway for aspiring fishers in Scotland um, for local workforce and what would be required to do that and whether there's been any engagement with any of your organisations from government to develop that kind of vocational pathway? Yeah. Uh, I, I, that, it's quite a, that's a big question. Can I, and, I, and, and I'm not being patronising, it's a very, very good question. Can we perhaps pick it up at the end to give everybody a wee chance to, to think about it? We'll move on to the next theme and if, we, if we've got scope at the end, but we'll pick it up, if, if you don't mind. I'm going to move on to Beatrice on, on the theme of uh, science. Uh, thanks, convener. And uh, it's already been touched on in numerous answers, the, the, the issue about scientific evidence, and we need evidence. Um, so I, I'd like to explore the issues of, of evidence, data and monitoring in inshore fisheries and uh, whether there's enough, whether you think there could be more done, and uh, how to build, the, you know, on the comments that Elaine has made about neutral science, how you can ensure that there's trust in the evidence that's underpinning uh, inshore uh, uh, fisheries as well. I wonder if there might be an opportunity to ask Sheila to explain the um, Shetland Shellfish Management uh, Organisation. Yeah, we'll Hannah have indicated. Yeah, Shetland seems to have developed a system which is the apple of the eye of many, um, but doesn't mean to say that it isn't under attack by many too. Um, our shellfish programme provides stock assessment and carries out applied research. To, to the UHI Shetland, I should say, assists in um, supporting the SSMO in their decision making to do comprehensive monitoring and evaluation of the stocks um, since 2000. So we have a baseline data now a baseline data that was developed in 2000, which has been added to with a data set since, since, since 2000. So we have over 20 years of, of data to ensure that we can, that the, the shellfish caught within the areas around Shetland is sustainable. And that comes from um, informing data, stock assessments, information from fisheries log books, biological data collected by observers from commercial fishing boats, sampling at processing factories um, and at the Vivier operators at the point of sale um, through targeted survey work um, using research vessels. All of that comes at a major cost, a major cost currently to the Shetland Islands, um, not supported through anybody outside of Shetland. Now, science needs funding, which is year-on-year -year data, 
It needs to be transparent. It needs to be clear that that data can be built on year after year. Now, this is the difficulty. So we also run an inshore survey on finfish, which again is funded by people in Shetland. We cannot get external funding very easily for this type of research because it is year on year. It's not innovative. It's not interesting to funding, think, funding streams. The current um, Scottish Fisheries Fund, which I never get the acronyms right because I still think it's EMFF, but um, it doesn't help a, a science in this thing to support sustainability for or evidence sustainability for inshore fishermen. Now, Shetland, because of its symbiotic relationship with whitefish and with pelagic and the importance of the SFA, the SFA wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the other fleets that we represent. All family-owned fleets that are still very vital to our rural uh, islands. Um, we need support with science. All of that in Shetland is at the risk of being lost because of funding being pulled from the support of that through um, tight budgets within local councils, etc. Okay. Alistair. Not only we don't have inshore stock assessments for most of the mainland, I know Shetland has been working very hard on, on, on theirs, and that allows them to facilitate a far, a far higher degree of sustainable fisheries management than we are working on in the mainland. Um, in the absence of the science, we should really be using the precautionary principle and in introducing some sort of effort controls, but we don't really have effort controls. There's no limit on the amount of trawling that can take place in a given area or the amount of creeling that can take place in a given area, so that's about as far from the precautionary principle as we could imagine. Um, and where we do have scientific advice, the government regularly ignores it. So, for example, when IC says you should close certain spawning grounds for herring or, or avoidance of cod, the government aren't doing that because it may have negative impacts on the fishing industry. And now that's fair enough to a point, but really we have to then have a plan on how we are going to get to implementing that scientific advice with a sense of urgency. And so I think these two issues, lack of access to stock assessments in shore and the ignoring of the scientific advice that we have, including implementing the precautionary principle, are all really big problems for inshore fisheries management. Hannah. Yeah, I agree with um, what's been said in terms that there's a huge paucity of data for inshore stocks and that just is really damaging to people's perception of how we're managing our fisheries and it's not giving anyone confidence that what we're doing is the correct thing. I think there is huge potential for inshore fleets to be able to help collect science just because they're out there every day and they're seeing these things. Um, in Orkney we're trialling this device that attaches to a fishing pot and it collects environmental data, so salinity, temperature, turbidity. So it's not just information about fish or shellfish species that we can collect, we can also collect environmental data that's going to be really important when we look at climate change and the impacts. So the importance of data isn't just for management and how we manage now, but it's also about future-proofing our industries and our communities. So it's something that I really think needs to be a priority. I think the inshore data has been overlooked for too long. Okay, thanks. Callum. Yeah, thanks, Kamina. Um, just to quickly endorse what was said before in the previous session about the need for spatial management. I mean, I've become at this committee in this parliament of predecessors for, for a long time, <laughs> talking about the, the need to integrate fisheries management into spatial management. Um, and uh, you, you, you end up with this sort of false dichotomy between sort of jobs and conservation because you don't have that integration and you don't have the recognition of ecosystem service benefits from, from protection. Um, and, and a lot of that is a, pr a product of the system. That comes into uh, item four. I just wanted to get that. Uh, on the record. Um, in terms of uh, science, you know, absolutely endorse the need for, um, for good science. Uh, there's a lot of good science already out there. Um, and the, uh, the Scottish Marine Assessment 2020 is, is a pretty good integration of the science that's available, which it, it paints a pretty stark picture. And I think that has to be recognised and injected in the conversation here, because you're talking about huge concerns about this condition of the seabed huge concerns, concerns with seabed, seabird numbers and so on. So um, for us, the health of the ecosystem is the, uh, you know, is the foundation upon which sustainable fishing has to be, has to be built. So um, uh, there, is, there, are, there is science there already. Let's use it. Okay. Elaine. Yeah, I think this 
goes back to the, the agency point for me as well, because I've sat in meetings where I've seen fishermen talking about things that are really important to them. Why are we not talking about feeding? Why are we not talking about things that we're seeing, at, you know, that we're seeing increasing spur dog, increasing predation? These things are coming true now that we're starting to get signs from ISIS. But for many years, I've watched these men almost be ignored. And I think the agency of voice is something that carries from fishing, from science right through to actually whether they get a berth at a local marina. Um, the, 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 I see the agency reducing, which is very, very worrying. Uh, we talked about precautionary and best available science. I think we have to understand that best available science might be something that's 25 years old using old technology. So if we're going to start making designations on, uh, for instance, a bird sighting 30 years ago by a citizen, I think uh, for fishing now, I think that we're in, we're in troubled waters. I think we have to try and get as much accurate data as we can. For me, the Norwegian system is very, very inspiring. Um, it's government working with scientists and working with fishermen in a reference fleet style. It's certainly lower cost than going out and building new boats. Um, we, we should be able to develop that trust. And I think trust is another thing that's very important because I think fishermen, I mean, certainly I know being involved with the Clyde trials, etc. Um, we, we need to build that trust because fishermen are worried that if they try and do sustainable projects that that information may be used in a way that that's not intended to be. As, as Sheila said and as, as Hannah said, we need just baseline science. It doesn't have to be innovative all the time. It just has to tell us what's actually happening. Um, I think climate change, citizen science and polarisation of, of actually different stakeholders' views is very important. And just to go back on and Jim's point about the funding, what I mean by funding and what I mean by neutral, I think, I think right now there's funding for science coming from Nature Scott, coming from Marine Scotland, coming from a host of different trusts with different interests and I think this is the, the connectivity between all of these are, is, is, is not always obvious you can be double I mean I find out about um, a herring, herring project which is happening on the west coast of Scotland which not one fisherman that I'm aware of knows about so these types of things we need to start getting some kind of connectivity and bringing them together I think that's vital thank you we've got lots of people indicated to come in can I, can I also add to the mix you talked about trust and, and, you know, the committee here looked at the, the COD box uh, fiasco, I think is probably what we, we, we could describe it as. And then we've heard the issues with, with herring and, and total, uh, total allowable catch and so on. Is, is there a lack of trust in, in the policies being brought forward right now um, or, or policies being developed which don't take science into consideration? Is that to, to me? Um, personally, I would say yes. Um, I think that we have tried to be as sustainable as we possibly can. I think everybody in CIFA wants to be sustainable and work with government. But I think if we're making decisions um, that are very heavily based on lobbying, whether it's by the fishing industry or by an ENGO group or anything, I think we need to step back from that emotive discussion and we need to actually look at trying to get the evidence better. And what I, I'm concerned about is the number of resources that are spent on things like FOIs and spent on trying to almost a gotcha culture when actually that money could be spent and let's try to get some baseline science we can all agree is sensible. Thank you. Simon. Yes, the uh, science has, has got a long way to catch up. Uh, a lot of the uh, you know, scientific information required is considerably out of date and uh, this is, is causing uh, you know, big question marks uh, right the way through. The uh, marine industries uh, in themselves, be it fishing, aquaculture, renewables, uh, cables, whatever, is overtaking the ability and capability of science to, uh, to keep pace with it. And uh, I mean, a, a classic um, instance of that is with the cables being laid from the uh, offshore renewable uh, developments to the mainland. And it's been shown that there's been deformities in uh, crustacean, like lobster and prawns, etc. It is, uh, also has, seems to be interfering with the migratory path of, of crab. Uh, and recently as well, just about a week ago, it was showing deformities in juvenile paddock. So this has all been installed without the science to see where the problems may be. So the whole industry's are all ahead of the science uh, aspect now. And uh, you know, science is, comes down to resources that I appreciate at the end of the day. And with lack of resources, it's going to be very difficult for the science to catch up 
and keep a pace with the, the way things are developing now. It's very concerning because this we're talking about the future, future generations to come are going to suffer because of what is being done now or what is not being done now because of lack of time and resource. Thank you. Um, Ariane's going to come in uh, with another question that the, the other stakeholders indicated maybe want to cover in their, their responses. Mm -hmm. Ariane. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, so I'm just like interested in hearing, right, this is, we need neutral science. So how do we get that science? Um, do we need something like uh, more, so, so somebody said the Scottish Government, it should come through the Scottish Government. It seems that to get that science, you need to actually get out on the water. I think there's a, you know, the piece about the, the REM, this kind of opportunity, because REM and the um, BMS could be a way, right? Uh, somebody was talking about, uh, Hannah, you were talking about in Orkney, you're actually gathering data. But it's like, how do we get that science? Do we need uh, vessels in all of the IFGs or something that are government, you know, Scottish Government Marine Scotland vessels that are, you know, I think we've got 18 of those or something. Um, so we've actually got science happening on the ground, being gathered, and somehow, we, how do we get to that point where we all agree about what we want uh, gathered and looked at? Because it, it does seem like we're all in a bit of a mystery here, uh, and there's um, you know kind of concerns flying around that we're not we're not actually basing our decisions on the right information. I'm going to go to, to Lucy and then Hannah. Thank you. Yes, I think, as, as Callum said, the, the state of the marine ecosystem is of fundamental importance to fisheries. If it's not healthy, then it's very difficult to see how we can achieve sustainable fisheries. Um, and I think it's really important that science is, also, is looking at the ecosystem. You know, so fisheries management is not just about science around stocks and particular sectors, but it's about the interaction of fisheries with the environment and how the environment can or can't support fisheries now and into the future. So it's really important that the breadth of science actually encompasses what, what would be required for an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries management, which is something that's required in the National Marine Plan but isn't actually currently being delivered. Okay. Anna. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to make some, some um, other points in, in terms of how can this be achieved. Um, some of the organisations and network were involved in uh, marine spatial planning through regional marine planning partnerships. There is the potential to realise better coordination and transparency of science around regional sea areas through effective regional uh, marine planning. <coughs> this isn't currently delivered at the moment. and, and I agree in that the um, approaches tend to be very piecemeal and they're uh, a bit bitty, but there is potential there if regional spatial planning was effectively supported and there was true coordination of science for regional sea areas uh, that brought the interest together. And I think it's also important that the committee understands that whilst we do have data gaps, whilst there is a requirement for improved long-term monitoring, we do have some very good evidence that just currently isn't being applied to fisheries management decision making. And this is about the relative impacts of different types of fishing gear. It's about how spatial management measures can actually help improve the condition of the environment to support fisheries. Can I just comment on that? So, just to, so I kind of understand. So that's an exciting kind of opportunity that you're putting there, the region, region, regional marine spatial planning. Um, and you're saying it needs to be supported. Can you be more specific? What, what, would we, what would we need to see in place to have that being supported? Can, can I just... We'll probably cover that in the next, next section if we can stick to the, to the science right now, but we'll bring you back in when we go to the sustainable fisheries management. Uh, Hannah. So I think to answer your question, I think there's two types of science that we really need. I think the first one is that very unglamorous baseline data that at the moment we are really struggling to achieve just because there's no funding for it and all the funding we generally get comes through piecemeal projects um, which doesn't allow for the creation of long-term data sets and that's the baseline we need to be able to understand where we are and where we're going. I think then once we have that we'll be able to have specific projects that try and find out data about potentially maybe the impact of electromagnetic frequencies on crab or about the specific um, impacts of MPAs, but we really need to have that underlying baseline data first, and I think that should be the number one priority. 
In terms of how we collect it, I think that the idea of regional data gathering would work. I would say it would be more appropriate to go through the IFGs than the marine planning partnerships, just because I feel that the marine planning partnerships are more for marine planning and not so much for data collection. And I don't know if they'd have the resources to actually do any research, but I think that idea of coordinating and making sure that there's communication between what we're doing between different areas can feed into an overarching um, database is really good. I also want to point out that I think the universities we have in Scotland have been doing really good jobs on helping supplement the data gaps as well. So in Orkney, we've got Harriet Watt University that's been doing a lot of work with us on our brown crab stock around Orkney. Shetland's got UHI, which has been doing fantastic work in the Shetland stocks. So I think there's a lot of resources and we don't need to just look at me in Scotland because I know they're impressed with resources, but the universities as well we could use. I also did want to come back um, and take this back a bit earlier to what we were just talking about, general the lack of science, and say that it has a demonstrable economic impact on the fleet, the paucity of it. So it's not just an abstract thing when we're saying about um, lack of data can make lead to poor management decisions, but it has had a noticeable impact on the fleet. So, for example, the Good Fish Guide rated the west of Scotland brown crab as being a void, and that's because it said of lack of stock assessment data. So it's having a huge impact now, and it's not just a theoretical um, negative impact, it's actually happening. Uh, we've got about five contributions uh, requested, so we'll, uh, and again, just uh, very aware of the time, um, Sheila, and then uh, Phil, and then Alistair. Um, I think science is a tool. Um, I think fisheries management systems need to come first. Um, you we can gather baseline, but if you don't measure, have somebody that is in control of um, asking the questions of what you want science to deliver, um, you're, you're producing data for data's sake. And I think it's very important that fisheries are at the, fishermen are at the heart of the, that fisheries management model for it to be successful. And that doesn't come from an, an empty, that comes from why we have created success in Shetland. Um, there are, there are excellent people within Scotland, within our own resources of, like said, UHI and um, things that are to be done through universities. They should be pulled upon, and we should be looking at centres of excellence for fisheries um, throughout Scotland and making use of that. Um, REM doesn't provide science; it provides data. Unless that data is assessed, it doesn't. It, it just produces figures and information. Um, and we have situations at the moment where you have offshore wind to be developed on, on um, spawn and stock uh, grounds that was assessed in 2008. Now, that's totally irresponsible as well, going back to offshore wind, have another dig about that. But um, I think science, if it's produced with a bias, um, isn't independent science, as, as Elaine has also said. Um, it depends who's asking the question. And that's where there has to be some kind of form of the baseline and creation of um, year after year, the end, so you're created the same way as ISIS does. And at the moment, in, if you were to take how ISIS creates um, their scientific model, which is seen to be the best available science that we have at the moment, um, if you take Shetland, there's four icy squares that covers the mainland of Shetland. At the moment, what is seen as appropriate science, the base, baseline for offshore fisheries, applying the same um, system to that, that would equate to four to eight toes of a commercial fishing vessel. We need granular science for inshore. Four to eight toes of inshore science is not enough. That's why we have an inshore survey in Shetland that is showing we now see that that science coming through into adult mature fish are now appearing on the grounds. Um, it's 50 toes that are assessed on an annual basis. Uh, Phil and then Alistair. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I just want to counter the view that we need government arbitrated science. I think that that's uh, really a problematic idea. I think that obviously the committee needs to be considering science as it's published and, and the transparency point around how that's created is really important, agreed. Clearly, uh, peer review publication is um, gold standard in that regard. And I welcome the, the view from uh, Sheila and Hannah that, you know, stuff coming from Highlands and Islands and Harriet Watt that's not arbitrated by government is also really valuable in this. We've got to move away from that idea. It's counter to Aarhus Convention, it's counter to freedom of speech, frankly. But of course, when it comes to um, government making decisions themselves, they do have scientists. 
and they do consult their in-house scientists, Marine Scotland Science, Scottish Natural Heritage, now Nature Scott, JNCC. Um, the advice that those organisations give to the managers in this area is frequently ignored, frequently ignored. Um, marine protected areas, uh, like, um, the committee will be aware of the story uh, we published recently of uh, scallop dredge damage within the Small Isles Marine Protected Area, an area which was uh, proposed for protection uh, based on credible science that was brought to the table by Nature Scott in 2014. That data is ignored in the, in the consequent time damage has occurred, we've lost a habitat, it's probably not going to come back in our lifetimes. Really problematic uh, issue with uh, 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 ignorance of the scientific evidence that was put forward to the decision makers at that point. And again, that comes back to the point that I made earlier, that I, uh, it, would be, it would be great if we could scrutinise that some, some more. Similar um, uh, point I wanted to, to make about REM. I uh, really welcome what Sheila was saying there about REM being a great source of data, but it needs analysed and it needs, that data needs turned into something useful. We have seen in um, Marine Scotland Science's own uh, reports that a reference fleet, applying that only to a reference fleet, isn't useful. It provides that the reference fleet behaves differently than the rest of the fleet. That's a, that's a report regarding COD bycatch in that instance. Um, so we need that data being collected across the fleet and that can then start to address some of the, the issues which have been raised about the fleet observing things on the, on the grounds which aren't filtering into decision making. Um, and will hopefully mean that we can all have a more transparent and uh, 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 better understanding of, of the situation through that data. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Alistair. Yeah, Phil actually covered a couple of things I wanted to mention. I'd concur with everything he said there. Um, I think there's always going to be a need for science, and, and we do need more science. I don't refute that at all. Um, but the science will always be behind the curve. And I think the most important thing is that we must act on the science that we do have. And we're regularly ignoring the science that we do have, whether it's about marine protected areas, spatial management, economic benefits of certain fisheries management regimes, and so on. So, for example, we know that there are catastrophic declines in our priority marine features and our, our, our inshore fish landings. But yet we haven't got a management plan to address either of those two concerns. I mean, that's just ignoring plain facts. And yes, there's science lacking on, on the detail of these priority marine features, but the science that we do have shows that every single priority marine feature is declining, and some of them quite at uh, frightening rates. But we have no plans to address this. There's, I think there's a consultation plan soon, but that's not urgent enough. So, you know, yes, we need more science, but we need to act on the science we have. And, and, for example, the Scottish Government has economic reports that, that they commission themselves and ones that we've supplied through the Scottish Keel Fishermen's Federation that show the introduction of spatial management will increase jobs in fishing whilst also attaining conservation gains. But yet the Scottish gov Government have ignored this. And I've heard a couple of people mention Norway and, and how productive Norway's inshore fishing is and how we should be looking at that model. Well, Norway introduced a 12-mile limit, effectively on almost all demersal towed gear in their inshore. And as a result, they have a thriving inshore fishing industry and a thriving inshore ecosystem. I mean, that's, those are simple scientific facts and we're just ignoring them. And yet we're arguing over whether or not we have enough detail at, at a granular level. And I appreciate we do need detail at a granular level, level, but we need to start thinking about just basic common sense fisheries management. We have to stop ignoring the scientific facts about introducing spatial management and protecting what's left of our priority marine features. OK, I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Charles uh, Callum and then Elaine and Sheila. Thank you. Um, actually, I concur with both what Phil said and what Bally said there. I mean, um, so it's sort of slightly kind of the points I was going to make have been made that we cannot rely just entirely on what um, comes out of marine Scotland science. Uh, there is a great deal of excellent work being done by the independent universities. And also, uh, we should um, look at this issue around the disconnect between Marine Scotland policy and Marine Scotland science. There is good information there that doesn't appear to be being used, and that is a really critical issue here, I think. So, okay. Otherwise, I essentially reiterate what they've said. Thank you. appreciate that. Uh, Callum. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Peer-reviewed science is peer-reviewed science. And um, uh, just to follow up some of the points that were made, Marine Scotland science study showed that less than 0.6% of historically trawled area in the study area was actually protected within the marine protected area network. So that's just a, um, a, a figure I think that should be in, in front of mind for the, the, the committee. Um, there's been a greater than 90% 90 90 decline in, in living, uh, living seabed habitats. Again, documented in Scottish, Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020, 50% decline in seabirds. 
So, you know, the, the science that's in front of us now is painting a picture of, of, of heavy and troubling uh, decline in our, in our uh, marine space. Um, there's always room for more science and more data. Of course there is, um, particularly in relation to stock assessments, and I concur with the point that was made earlier on that, and also to clear an interest, our organisation does a good fish guide, and we, we think about this really carefully and look about this, at this really carefully. So we, we also understand that there's data there that, um, you know, there's, if there's data collected, we, we'd like to see that in the public realm. We want to see informed decision making, um, uh, you know, not least to address many of the false dichotomies that I'm, I'm talking about. I think um, working as a UK organisation with UK colleagues, they also look across the UK and, and believe it or not, with the, um, uh, uh, with, with the, the National Marine Plan Interactive and Scotland's Marine Assessment, you know, there's a lot of data there that's being presented and, and is available for us to inform uh, sustainable ecosystem-based progressive decision-making that isn't available in the, in the sort of layered context that it is in Scotland. So there's a sense of, let's actually, backing up what Charles says, let's use the data there and, 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 and let's use it in a, in a productive way. And, and lastly, just to um, echo the importance of um, data through uh, REM with cameras, that's something, again, I've brought to predecessor committees, uh, uh, the importance of that, and we're, we're, you know, we're sensitive to the fact these are people's workplaces, but REM with cameras is in workplaces routinely, and there's ways of doing it which, which respect people's, um, th respect that and, and people's place where they're, where, they're, um, uh, where, where they're living when at sea. So just to c uh, bring the committee's uh, awareness to a report that we did with WBF and RSPB called Transparency. <clears throat> so there's a report there looking at REM and the benefits of that. Um, and, you know, I think, I think what everybody can agree on is we, you know, we want to make informed decision making and that's based on everybody having the same kind of set of information in front of them to do ecosystem based management with the green ecosystem to be protecting nursery areas and productive areas for fish and shellfish. It's just common sense. Yeah, Elaine and then Sheila. Just to pick up on the point that Bally made about Norway having a 12 um, nautical mile limit, I can, I can um, contest the fact I was in Norway and I ate some shrimps from an inshore fishery. And I'm happy to send on governmental advice that that's not really the case. There's different types of fisheries within those areas and, and maybe trawling isn't quite as prevalent, prevalent but it does, it does happen there. It just happens in certain areas. I've ate the shrimps. Um, but in terms of, of, of science, I, I think we, we talk a lot about things like landings. There's no landings in certain areas. And it goes back to Sheila's point about infrastructure, markets. Nobody is going to land a, a box of fish if they have no quota for it and they have no ice to store it. And, and I had um, a fisherman who had spoke to me about um, going to herring. And we know about the herring tank being cut because the science actually failed us. Uh, it, the, the, that's what happened. Um, and we were, you know, he said we were not mercenaries, we're not going to, to catch fish that we can't actually get to a market. Why would we do that? We wouldn't do that. And I think people need to understand that what you're seeing in the landings going down is a lot to do with quota and infrastructure as well as anything else. It's not always to do with science or the fact that the fish aren't there. Um, I think, just for, for, for reference, and I said I think Marine Scotland should be more involved in science, I think we do need an honest broker. And I think I talked about Norway, where it's between government, scientists, fishermen, and I guess interested parties as well. But we do need that honest broker. I'm not suggesting that government do all the science. I'm suggesting that they have an overview of what we use and what we don't use in a sensible way. And I'll go back to the, the, the closures that we had earlier this year. We had closures based on a discussion paper which actually ended up impacting creel fishermen the, the most because of noise. And technically, if we'd have taken that paper to, the, to its word, we would have closed every single boat that was making a noise in that area. So we have to, discussion points are very helpful and peer reviews are very helpful, but we have to have some kind of sense about how we, how we interpret that. I um, also think it's really important to look at practical fishing methods and science. Science will work to set stations, and that is correct to do that. It will have a methodology, and it will work to set stations. 100% agree with that. However, when you talk about fishermen, they will maybe go out for a certain species in a certain area at a certain time of day. They will not go fishing for herring during the day. And we have to understand if we're sending out government boats that are going out during the day, and they're very big, and they can't go in shore, we might not find a true picture of just what the fishing is. So you need to have a combination of that practical fishing science as well as the scientific methodology and it's that combination that will give us the answers of, to, to, to what we really need to know. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, Sheila. Uh, on that point, can I just ask Galine, 
Do you believe that um, Marine Scotland have the resource uh, to be able to improve their data collection um, and, and the cited evidence that um, everyone around the table is, is craving for, really? Not at the moment. And I think if you look at areas where they're doing well, and Sheila talked about how they, they, it's cost them a great deal, and they're, they're quite, uh, you know, it, you have to have fishing boats that are quite healthy to be able to even contribute to that uh, economically and, and work in partnership with others to, to get that. I, mean, I don't think they have, but I think there's ways around about it. And I keep saying, look, let's look at the Norwegian model. Why are we not looking at reference fleets? Why are we not trying to bring the fishermen in to give us more reflexive data? I mean, they can close a fjord. Um, within two weeks, for two weeks, while well, the spawning is happening, and then open it back up again. There's not three-month closures in the same way. Why? Because they have reflexive data, which has been fed, fed in all the time, at a far lower, lower cost than potentially some of these big surveys would be. So we, there's ways to think our way around it, um, but we're not doing that at the moment. I didn't think this statement would ever come out of my mouth today, but... I agree with Phil said um, uh, about peer review for we science. We have success. <laughs> <laughs> um, peer review for science, and this, is, this crosses the boundaries of inshore fisheries into all fisheries we have within the Scottish waters. We need peer-reviewed science. Currently, we have science from ICES, which is the best available science. We do not know whether it's good or bad because it's never peer-reviewed. Um, reference fleets act differently to... Um, the comment that was made, reference fleets act differently to commercial fishing boats. We currently have surveys undertaken by vessels that are far from um, replicating what commercial fishermen do. There's problems with that. And when you have people relying on their livelihood from science, which is flawed to begin with because it can't, they can't capture fish the same way as a commercial fishing vessel is, you're never going to replicate what actually is happening on fishing grounds. This, this conversation has gone on for years and years and years. It's time to step up and get these things right. Peer reviews, uh, science being gathered by vessels that behave in a way that commercial fishing fleets do. Um, the Shetland Fishermen's Association has been working hard to try and press that fishermen want to get involved in data collection. Um, Let's work in partnership. The resources in Marine Scotland are tightly, tightly squeezed. This year we've been trying to do a uh, survey with whitefish vessels. It has been knocked back at every turn and we are yet to understand why that is the case. Now, inshore fishermen, we can gather data using vessels. There are protocols that have been set up that year after year fishermen can gather these data. Who knows where spawning grounds are? Fishermen, not scientists all the year round. Fishermen are the best knowledge keepers of what's happening on fishing grounds. Good or bad, they, will, they don't want to. Our fishermen in Shetland and fishermen all around the world do, do not want to fish when they see that their stock's under pressure. They are responsible, they're fishing over grounds year after year after year. Especially in Shetland, we, the people are fishing responsible because custodians of the sea at this point in time for the next generation of their families and people in their community yet to come. Don't treat them like they're criminals. They are custodians and, and they need to be responsible fishermen with science to back that up. So let them work in partnership with Marine Scotland at Squeezed. The door is open, just push it, it's there. I'm, I'm going to bring in, just to, to bring this to an end, um, Lucy, and then Phil. Thank you. Um, uh, as has been acknowledged, we've obviously got um, information and data gaps. Uh, fishermen, coastal communities and the wider marine community all have a really key role to help play in actually collecting and providing data to inform decision-making. So whilst we would agree that peer-reviewed papers are the gold standard, we shouldn't ignore the data that is collected through citizen science, through individuals who are out and about in the marine environment. It's contributed a huge amount to the knowledge for Scotland seas across the board. Marine Scotland, Scottish Government doesn't have the resources to tightly manage every single piece of information that's coming into the system. Um, and I think it would be a detriment to you know, management of fisheries and the marine environment in Scotland if we are to ignore this data. If there are issues around transparency of it, then that needs to be addressed. But I think we need to be open to the information that's coming from all sectors of people who are interested in the health of Scotland's seas. Thank you. Phil. 
I just wanted to say it's good to hear, Sheila, that we agree on something, but also to extend that offer uh, to, you know, as the, some members of the committee will know, we run a research vessel over the summer and very uh, keen to work with anybody in collect, collecting data there. It might be called non, not neutral. I don't really mind that. We can deal with that at the time. Um, we worked with fishermen around the coast as we did that work, and uh, if there are questions that the committee or others feel that need to be answered, uh, we have the skills and the experience to address those, and I'm very keen to work with anyone uh, to help do that. Thank you. Um, no, sorry, sorry, Jim. No, we're, we're going to have to move on. We're, we're now nearly 20 minutes uh, over time. We're going to move on to the next theme, Ariane. Thanks, Convener. And I mean, in a way, we're going to move on to the theme of fish, uh, sustainable fisheries management. But in a way, we've been touching in on that. So. Um, you know, Scotland's marine environment faces many pressures as we've kind of been highlighting change in composition and distribution of species due to climate change, declining seabird populations and the recent bird flu crisis, seabed damage due to fishing pressures and so on. And the kind of areas that, you know, we're interested to kind of talk about in, you know, in this time frame is, you know, the issues around climate change and what's happening there, uh, future catching plan and remote electronic monitor monitoring the uh, proposal to bring forward highly protected marine areas, fisheries management plans, and, and I think importantly, I think it's coming to light in some ways, um, um, enforcement and the lack of resources for that. Um, so I'd like to address, um, so, that, so the evidence shows that there's a need to restore the biodiversity, and that has come out in the conversation already, and there's an agreement there. Uh, and, and we've also talked about the spatial squeeze, and with the uh, arrival on the horizon of this proposal uh, from the Scottish Government and the Greens and the Butte House Agreement around HPMAs, um, I'd like to hear, and I think maybe firstly from Bali, um, around, uh, you know, how would we manage that spatial squeeze if we do bring in HPMAs? I know we have had conversations about that issue in the past. I think it would be good to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think it was mentioned in the first session, spatial squeeze is probably one of the biggest concerns that, that we all share. It's certainly one of the, one of the main concerns that, that I think everybody across every sector of the fishing industry is very concerned about. The highly protected marine areas in principle, I think it's a very good idea to have reference areas and baselines for, for what unfished areas look like. However, we're talking about introducing them into the context of an already very spatially squeezed area and, and it's, it's, there's a serious danger that the introduction of marine protected area management measures and highly protected marine areas will squeeze the fishing industry to the extent that they will compromise the areas that are not protected and they will also compromise the viability of the businesses that, that are trying to operate in these areas that are not protected and I think that's a, that's a really, really big issue. I think to exacerbate this problem is that we don't know where the spatial footprint of the fishing industry is. The, the inshore under 12 metre fleet hasn't been fitted with vessel tracking systems despite the government's repeated promises to do this over the years. I think the last promise was that it would be fitted across the fleet by 2019 and we're now hearing that it will be consulted on by the end of this parliamentary term. So, um, but if we don't understand the spatial footprint of the fishing industry where the various sectors and various gears are being operated, how can we possibly pragmatically introduce marine protected area management measures in highly protected marine areas without knowing who we're displacing, what we're displacing, how much of a problem this is going to cause for local communities. For example, Loch Torridon, it's, it's heavily populated with priority marine features. If you look at a map of priority marine features in Scotland, the, some of the highest concentration are in Loch Torridon. It's almost exclusively operated by creel vessels. Now, if you were just a desk job, you might look and say, well, that's a really good place for a highly protected marine area. We'll protect all these really you know, sensitive features, and, and I would advocate that they need protection. But you could simultaneously be displacing some of the lowest impact fishers and some of our most fragile fishing communities. So I think the introduction of highly protected marine areas has to be done really carefully, and we're kind of putting the cart before the horse here if we don't have vessel tracking installed in the fleet first, and also if we don't have fisheries management plans on how to mitigate this displacement. Um, I would really emphasise that we need vessel tracking and fisheries management plans if, before we introduce these things so that they don't have negative consequences. And we bring in Hannah, Phil and then Sheila. Yeah, I definitely agree with Bally about that. It's a huge concern about the impacts that these um, HPMAs can, could have on the fishing industry and the socioeconomics of it as well. I think the fishing industry, we've mentioned climate change a few times, we're in Orkney, we're definitely seeing that, we're seeing changes in how the species move and behave. So making sure that we create resilient ecosystems that are healthy is a huge priority for us because it helps the ecosystem obviously, but it also helps us survive. But 
there's a lot of unknowns and yeah i would definitely echo bally's thoughts on this okay there phil thank you yeah i'd just echo again the, the point that bally's made there about fisheries management plans and, and hopefully further it a little the committee last year obviously considered the joint fisheries statement uh, which was part of the UK Fisheries Act, a requirement under that. And within that, uh, Marine Scotland had established that it would deliver fisheries management plans for some of these fisheries um, by 2022. There, there's no progress on that. Highly protected marine areas need to sit within a broader uh, spatial plan and broader uh, management plan for these fisheries. It's really important. Thank you. OK, I, I miss Charles. Charles and then uh, Priscilla. Thank you. I mean, I... <laughs> um, I think the you know, HPMAs, clearly there's a, a powerful need for them given the uh, fact that the MPAs are not necessarily um, functioning as initially understood, that they aren't giving the protection that a lot of people would expect of them. But there is a very serious concern about the playoff between the, the conservation benefits and indeed fisheries benefits coming from HPMAs but, and also the existence of the um, fishing industry in terms of displacement um, and th that's going to be a real challenge and I think uh, Phil touched on it there just there and I would absolutely emphasize it that in order for them to be successful they need to be put into the context of a wider management plan for fishing and it brings us back to where we were at the outset around the need for um, coherent rational evidence-based national planning and um, and the HPAs have to sit within that framework thank you um, Sheila I agree that um, HPMAs need to be evidence-based and very transparent about what they're hoping to deliver. And I say hoping because we have already discussed science, um, the lack of science that's available for commercial fishermen. Who's going to gather this baseline data for all these HPMA areas? 10% of Scottish waters. Now, we're yet to understand if that's going to be 10% of inshore and 10% of offshore. This is serious concerns the fishermen that inadvertently by closing off 10% of our ground, you could just close off the most valuable fishing areas. Fishing has to be at the forefront of where these areas should be in terms of ensuring sustainability. Um, we currently have massive areas being closed off to fishing through proposed areas for offshore wind. Now, it's been questioned, why can HPMAs not include offshore wind? Oh no, because... Um, that's a commercial activity. Well, if you tell me offshore wind then has a negative impact on our environments, it's, it's competing policies within Marine Scotland here that are very crucial that you get this right. Everything needs to be, because HPMAs will be introduced. When will they be unintroduced? It's not clear, it's not evidence-based, it's not based on conservation benefits. It's a promise to the Greens from the SNP government. Admit it. Don't stop reflect don't just fulfill a promise without thinking about the impacts of what you're going to do in the, in the meantime and you also look at the socio-economic measures of doing it the negative measures that you will incur by proposing hpmas in fishing grounds you will close off rural communities and i think i've said that too often why are we looking at policies that are closing off valuable vital jobs in rural areas can I just pick you up, you up on that? Are, are you suggesting that the, the Butte House Agreement has taken us backwards? Um, again, we, we touched on the Clyde Cod box and the precautionary principle came in there and it, it would appear that it was all down to something in the Butte House Agreement that would put us in that place. Is, is that what you're suggesting? I am suggesting that. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's a conflict here. There, there was areas closed because of noise and impacts on fishing. What do you think offshore wind does when you put them in nursery areas for fishing and spawning areas? That's what you're proposing. Why in a tiny area of Clyde is that a huge thing? But the policy of the marine government is putting wind, offshore wind farms in the middle of spawning and nursery grounds. To me, that is totally irresponsible. Elaine. And when we're talking about um, the ecosystem, I agree, and I think most fishermen will agree that you need a healthy ecosystem to have you know, any kind of future and going forward. Um, but I would stress that people are part of the ecosystem. 
And what I'm seeing now is a reduction in fishing, the, the population in fishing villages, the reduction in the boats. I've already explained that the boats are going down far more than the stats in the SPICE report are saying because of practicalities. We, we need to start to understand that. Um, I would go back to the MPAs and before implementing highly marine protected areas, look at what's happening in Lindisfarne to the static gear fishermen and the mobile gear fishermen and, and let's see if we can benchmark before we, we do something that we maybe can't step back from. And I think also, I mean, again, the Clyde, we've got no take zones, etc. We've got the MPAs. I, I keep going back to this. A commitment was made in Parliament that we would have a five-year monitoring plan in that. We don't have it socioeconomically or scientifically. And I think we really need to get that in place before we start to think about what else we do. We might need them. We might need them. Of course we might need them, uh, other measures. But it has to be evidence-based. Um, and we've talked a lot about the National Marine Plan and the Regional Marine Plan. Um, I think we need to be understanding what different policies mean. And I think, I think the problem is what an MPA means in paper can be, can be read by different parties in different ways. And we need to start understanding what the legislation actually means. Because maybe you can fish sustainably in some MPAs, maybe you can't. But I think there's a lot of wishful thinking about, I mean, you know, we can't, we can't project what we want things to be in legislation. It has to be legislation. OK, thanks. I'm going to bring in Karen here just to, to add another question to the mix, and then I'll bring in the stakeholders that have indicated. Thank you, convener. Um, just trying to marry up a few things in my mind, and I mean it's very clear we've got some, uh, you know, really strong advocates for the industry here, and uh, you know I, I really respect that. And um, it's just trying to marry up how you know we're, we're talking about a climate emergency that we're in at the moment. Now we're talking about two very important aspects to us as human beings, and that is energy and food. And you know one can't really come before the other. We have to be looking at these together and not in, in separate silos. Um, in terms of, I mean, renewable energy, in the first six months of this year, Scotland generated um, enough renewable energy to power Scotland twice. You know, we're doing fantastic in that area. Things are great. We've got the science going, you know, but it, it just... Um, but we're, we've still got the highest energy costs. Uh, I mean, we're looking at food um, processors, fish fish processors are, are just on the brink of collapse because of electricity costs. So there's a lot of things going on here. We need fish, it's good, healthy food, it's sustainable for us. So how do we ensure that there isn't always this clash between two very important aspects? Um, and I think it does come into, you know, the, the marine, the planning, um, obviously the science as well. It seems to be a whole scope here. So how, I mean, what are the solutions to actually just bring that all together? We've got two, um, you know, in Scotland, talk about the Scottish Government, but we're also restricted with a lot of what's going on at UK Government. I think we've, we've got now a new minister. I think it's, she's a coffee as well. So we'll have to have those conversations cross-government um, and just and cross-industry. So I'm hearing all this. So I'm just really putting out a question is like, what is the solution here then? How do we gather all that together? <laughs> yeah. um, Simon, I'll bring you in. Right, thank you, Convener. Uh, um, yeah, I fully back what, uh, what Sheila was saying there. I, I question how they arrived at the figure of 10% of the water is to be taken. I mean, it seems a very clinical number that's sort of been plucked from the air. Say, so, OK, we'll take 10% of the ground. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have the science backing to it at this stage. I may be wrong, correct me if I am. But it will actually equate to more than 10% from the fisherman's eye, because if you were to drain all the water out of the sea and look at the, the topography that's left, not all that ground is fishable. In fact, there's an awful lot of that ground that is not fishable. And it's the same if you look out over the countryside and you look at a, a farm, how much of that farmland is actually usable? So that 10% that we're talking about, in actual fact, probably will double up to about 20%. So it is, uh, it, it's back to the old enemy spatial squeeze. And this is, is, is a really, really serious spatial, spatial uh, squeeze. And it brings into question, with, with Karen, food security. And that's another byword of today as well. I mean, it's a fact. More people are alive today than have ever died. Now, that 
is a thought to leave and to, to ponder over, but, but it is fact. So these people need feeding. And so it is very important that we have a low carbon production method, i.e. fishing. And uh, we have sufficient quantities of a high, uh, highly nutritional value of a food, which is fish. So I, you know, I, I, this 10 percent, I think, is, uh, you know, is a figure that would appear to have been plucked. And I would like to ask the question of the government exactly how did they arrive at the 10 percent figure. OK, thanks. Uh, Lucy. Thanks very much. Um, I, we really have to get serious about the degraded native nature of Scotland's seas. You know, it's in a really serious situation, and it's, this is not just about biodiversity, it's also about climate change mitigation and, and the well-being of everybody who depends on the health of the seas. Um, and local communities, you know, within a network and wider, we've seen the loss of habitats and marine life in our local areas, and we've seen the associated loss of jobs and economy as a result of that. You know, the once abundant fish stocks now long longer exist. This isn't an opportunity that exists, and it's alongside the degradation of marine habitats and species within the wider marine ecosystem. And whilst I would acknowledge that MPAs are not selected under the current situation for fisheries purposes, they, they fundamentally can help contribute to the recovery and sustainable management of our seas alongside other spatial measures. Um, and from the network, we can see that highly protected marine areas have the potential to help contribute to recovery and protection and sustainable management. But we do also share the concerns that if this is just taken forward as, as a single interest piece of work, it will result in, in displacement and frustration and anger from many different stakeholders because it's not, we're not seeing it as a whole. We're not looking at the carrying capacity of the system to actually support fisheries and other industries as a whole. We have no spatial management, and those are things that have to be addressed in fisheries management but wider for the inshore seas. Thank you. Barry, I've got a question on... Yeah, just uh, coming in on what you were saying, Lucy, I mean, and, and, and I think something that's emerging for me in this conversation is we, we, we keep talking about fishers, but it seems to me that there are more stakeholders in Scotland's inshore, uh, increasing community engagement and all that kind of thing. And I just wonder, who do you think? So um, a few weeks ago, gosh, I can't remember when, some weeks ago we had Marine Scotland in the room uh, and we were talking about HPMAs and, and there was a, a commitment for a co-design, I can't remember the exact words, but um, and, and that the community would be involved. And I just wonder, you know, what do we mean by the community? And I'm, I'm just curious to hear what you think, you know, who should be around the table in thinking about HPMAs around Scotland? Lisa, if you want to kick off, then I'll, I'll okay. go to Alistair. It essentially needs to involve all those who have an interest in, in the health of our coasts and seas and, and the future use of them. Um, fisheries are a public resource, and as such, they should actually be being managed in the public interest. To exclude community voices and wider stakeholder interests from decision-making is ignoring this fact, and, and it stops us from looking at fisheries management from an ecosystem-based point of view and talking about rational spatial management that integrates protected areas into such a programme. Alistair and then Phil. I'd like to come back to the questions. One, one was asked by the convener, which was, was the Butte House agreement a negative thing? And um, the other one was, how do we reconcile um, the conservation and the, the, the industrial aspects of the management of our seas. And I think everything here relies on context. If we're talking about this in the context of introducing extensive spatial management to our inshore and implementing a just transition to more sustainable fisheries in our inshore, then I think these are positive things. I think we can, we can have a thriving inshore fishing industry that's compatible with conservation gains if, if we manage it correctly. But if we're looking at this in the context of just throwing or removing 10 per cent from the existing paradigm, then, then it will be a negative thing. And um, I think that's, that's it's a really important point to make, that we, we have to start thinking about whether or not we're, we're talking about a transition for our inshore ship fishing industry here towards a more sustainable fishing industry. And if, if, if we do this right, we, we, we project that you could have more jobs in the inshore fishing industry with less catch. We projected that you could have conservation gains equivalent to the marine protected areas. Um, and far less environmental degradation if we just use the right gears in the right place at the right time. And Phil, and then Hannah. 
Thank you. I think Lucy eloquently responded to the question, who should be in that room? So I won't answer that. But I'd like to answer Karen's, if I may. Um, I, think it was, I think it was a really important point you made about the balance between renewable energy and renewable food, which is what seafood effectively is, if managed properly. Um, we need to note that the current system is not helping us yield the most from that resource. It is not renewable in that many fisheries are overfished, and it is not increasing catches. Bucky, in your own district, I believe the, uh, the, the landings figures produced earlier this year showed a 40% decline from 2017. Malag, over 60%. So the current system is not helping us yield protein from the sea. If we allowed stocks to recover, which includes ending overfishing, but also habitat protection, which highly marine protected areas can provide uh, support for, as can proper management through a national marine plan, we will have a much larger resource. I've put into the briefing that the estimates are, at the moment, total catch of cod from the North Sea, I, I can't remember the exact figure, around 13,000 tonnes, I think, something like that, uh, for all countries. But if recovered, could be a resource around 50,000 tonnes, sustainable uh, pr protein coming out of that area. Um, this, is, this needs uh, conservation action, and I think that that's the problem at the moment. The, the idea is if we establish highly protected marine areas or something like that, we will reduce what we can take out of the sea. Actually, if we continue as, as, as we are at the moment, we will reduce what we can take out of the sea. We need action to allow us to recover and then extract from the sea something, uh, you know, more productive, uh, establish a more productive sea, which we can extract more from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got Hannah, Sheila, Elaine, Callum, and then Charles. So, Hannah, please. Um, I was also going to answer Ms Adams' question um, about the renewables and fishing. I think... Renewables is obviously incredibly important for net zero, and as a fishing industry, I said before, we're already be in, being impacted by climate change, so fully supportive of Scotland's journey to net zero. I think our only concern is just, it's not so much, well, it's both, it's the scale of what's happening, but it's also the pace of what's happening. Um, I think we've highlighted before about the issues of science and how there's not enough science and science is lagging behind. It's the same when we're talking about renewables and their impacts on the fishing grounds and also things like the electromagnetic frequencies on brown crab behaviour and metabolism. I think one of the solutions is, is smarter planning and the planning system at the moment, I think it still works too much in silos and it doesn't have that holistic, comprehensive approach that we need, which is one of the reasons SFF and NFFO published that paper, which was because no one else was looking at the cumulative impacts. I think it's also things like smart planning. So it's looking at, can we co-locate some of these things? Can we co-locate in the future renewable offshore wind farms with, say, aquaculture? I know that's something that is being potentially explored. Um, and also things looking at cables at the moment it will have several cables coming off of several different um, wind energy farms, but is there not a way to just combine those cables and have it into one, which would minimise the impact? So there's things we can do on the planning side, and then there's things we can do practically, and it's all about trying to make it as smart as possible. I think a lot of that is having a dialogue between all the different stakeholders. Thank you. And Sheila? There's a lot of things to, to comment on. Um, I think there's a lot being said about the average state, the state of our stocks. Um, there's actually a survey, a, a scientific research done based on ICES work in Shetland that actually shows that the, uh, the total biomass of our fisheries is actually 80% higher than it was 20 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation going around the room. Now that might not be the case in all areas. So we have to take generalised statements down to the regional differences and the complexities of each area within within um, a re our region of Scotland, which is, is is very diverse. It's the nuances of fisheries management within different areas that we need to look at there. Um, uh, we can't base things on citizen science. It needs to be on proper scientific data. Um, I totally agree with what Karen says. We, we need green energy, but we also need to balance that with the need to eat. And the low-carbon food choice is the best thing people should be eating, or else they have a, a higher impact on the environment. There's things that we have come up with uh, that can hope to mitigate the errors that have happened so far, that we have things happening in, uh, in areas where there's foreign stocks, where uh, there's prolific fishing grounds. Um, 
we kind of have, we feel as an industry, very down about the fact that we've probably lost the fight of stopping these happening in our most prominent fishing grounds. But we hope through the marine planning process and through the consenting process that fisheries will um, be able to fight their corner and be listened to in the socio-economic impacts this will have on fishing. We already have depleted fleets in our in our rural areas. Um, we can't be at the cost of depleting them to produce green energy when you need both. Um, you need to maximise the returns to island communities, to rural areas from these from offshore wind through supply chains. We question how much local economies will get from offshore wind. You need, we need to hold these people, these, these companies who are based not in Britain, these profits will go to other countries. Don't pay, let the cost come to Scotland from profits going to other countries. Hold them to account of supply chain promises. Make sure that the benefits come from this to to companies based in the UK, based in, not in the UK, in Scotland, especially in island and rural communities. Or else all you're doing is producing energy for other people, for Scotland to export it for everybody else to get cheaper energy. Hold them to account for community benefit, for um, cheaper energy to communities. We had a very interesting discussion with our local council yesterday who, they have a responsibility to ensure that there's jobs in the future for, for island-based communities. I get that, but not at the cost of fishermen that were there in the past, are there now and will be. If you take it like a timeline, fishing will always be there, especially, I would say, in Shetland, where we have the infrastructure, we have the, the fish, the fish are there. Many of these areas are struggling today because the fish aren't there. In our island community, the one I represent, we don't have that, but we are also. We produced a map of fishing effort for the any one area that showed that fishing effort was to the north of that area and to the south of that area. Wind farm developers, what happened? They produced um, a map where they would like to develop wind farms to the south, to the north, and in the middle, close off that area. Now, is that an organisation that is really interested in protecting fishing? I question their motives of what they're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, again, just to bring your attention, we're, we're running about 20 minutes over time. Are, are, are the stakeholders all happy to, that we continue and we'll probably have another 10 minutes on this topic, then, then move on? Can everybody hang around for an extra 20 minutes? Good. Um, Jenny, I think you had a supplementary on that and then I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Elaine. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. It was <clears throat> more a supplementary on what Bali talks about and I'd just be interested to get other stakeholders' views as well. In the, you mentioned just transition. What, what does that look like? And I suppose it brings in some of the points that Sheila's just made as well um, about the connectivity between um, the green um, renewables and I think the point that uh, both Karen and Phil made about renewable food as well. <clears throat> I think there's, the, there's a few potential scenarios. Um, I think we have to start by recognising there's overcapacity and it's only going to get worse because, because of the spatial squeeze. Um, and then we have to figure out, well, well wh where is that overcapacity and how do we, how do we mitigate against it? And uh, I think decommissioning is one historic example of how we've dealt with overcapacity in the fishing industry. Transitioning some of the boats to more, sele uh, more selective gear that offers higher employment is another option. Um, and uh, another option is zoning the, the inshore for, for the size of vessels so that the biggest vessels aren't squeezing the next size vessels down and so on, all the way till you get to the tiniest vessels inshore. Um, those three options are, are variations of all of those three could be implemented. Most of those are going to cost money and almost every single one of them requires installing vessel tracking in the boats so we know where the spatial footprint of the industry is and introducing fisheries management plans so we can determine how we would like to manage a fishery in any given region or area. I'd like to, to, to comment on that and then I'll bring in Elaine. Yeah, I, I think just transition, I think it's a really good phrase and I think it means a lot of different things for everyone. Um, for me, I think just transition, when I talk about it in terms of what it means for the inshore, I actually don't think it means anything specific to just fishing. I think everything that I said does he does have a point, but I think it's also about the wider communities people operate in. So just transition for inshore fishing is looking at things like in the community accommodation so we can attract labour to these places. It's looking at childcare, it's looking at the bigger picture because I think that is what's going to empower communities and the industries that work in these communities 
to do better and to have the investment, but we really need that foundational support to go forwards. But if we are talking about fishing, I think there's other things we can do. There's improving infrastructure, there's helping in Orkney as well, um, diversification of boats so we can fish for different things and we're not just so reliant on these few species. So there's a lot of different things, but I think just transition, I think it's moving a whole community towards that transition, not just specific sectors. Charles, have you got a comment on, on that? Yeah, I was. I mean, just, I mean, I concur with what Hannah and Bali have said. Um, but I think a really important component in this, and it's something we've seen in other sectors, you know, seen it in the agriculture sector as we speak, it's going through this building, the whole question of a transitional support mechanism. Um, and that, that is crucial, and that, that has to be put in place. Um, so whilst, yes, it's, there's what's going on onshore, but it's also about actually funding mechanisms to, to support the industry to shift to lower um, impact fisheries. And, and without that, it's, it, there's going to be a real problem. And just, um, I think a critically important thing is, and it's all very well for me to say it from an NGO perspective, but that the, the industry's role in that has to be absolutely central and kind of at the full, forefront of this. I think it's a really important point in the whole viability of just transition. Yeah, it, it does seem quite bizarre that there's a, a well-established just transition when it comes to agriculture and moving away from some traditional methods of farming, but that uh, doesn't exist in the, the fishing industry. Exactly. Um, now, um, hey, Elaine, I think. Yeah. Elaine was next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to go back to Ariane's question, she'd asked about what kind of communities should be involved, and I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with having a, 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 a broad church of stakeholders. You should. That's absolutely correct. Everyone should have a voice. Pre-COVID, um, we, we actually used to have the Inshore Fisheries Conference where anyone could come along, anyone at all. Anyone could come and make a comment. Uh, we've also had lots of public consultations. We had FMAX and FMAX, which were attended by ENGOs as well. So I feel that previously, when we could all meet in person, there was definitely things the way where people could connect. There are no other stakeholders at IFGs, but what I would stress is that IFGs are the only area where all fishermen can come together to try and actually find out what kind of policies might work. And that's not always the same. So I think that's really important to have that feeding into IFMAX and a wider structure. But yes, I don't believe in exclusion. You should have everybody there, but it should be appropriate involvement. You asked me what communities are. Well, to me, communities are, are also fishermen. And the morale I see in fishermen at the moment is, is extremely concerning. Why, you ask? Because their communities are crumbling in some areas inshore. Now, um, I think Phil just mentioned that the landings are down. Yes, the landings are down because we had Brexit. We had COVID and we've had a lot of different environmental policies that have impacted. For instance, uh, you know, we've had areas closed down for, for a long period of time that interferes with the market. The landings are down. And we already talked about the fact about science, that science is not reflective of what you land. And I think Lucy had made the point um, that, that the fish stocks are all in decline. Well, we actually just had a big discussion about that. We don't know if they always are. We know they're changing. And we know that that might actually mean something for fishermen too. So maybe they are going to diversify and we want to look at different things which, which they can look at. But I think we, we need to be aware that when we're talking about Scotland being an inclusive place as well and what communities mean, I think we're getting to a critical mass now. And I, I talked about agency before. Um, I'm going on Thursday to a meeting to, to say if I can make sure that three of my member boats still have a berth because they're being pushed out um, of their berthing. They're, they're, small organ, they're small boats, and it's mainly leisure craft and other types of craft that's there. So fishermen are facing this everywhere because they don't have that, that, that agency to, to take things forward. And if I go to St Andrews, we've got one of our colleagues there. Um, they've just had a seaweed farm placed in an area where they fish. Um, and, and there's been very little connection with the local fishermen. Likewise, they had a net store, which had always historically been there, re reduced because there was a very strong community group that didn't want there to be a fishing net store on a pier, which had always been a fishing pier. And I think we need to understand that fishermen are, are, are very, very, they're feeling very, very low down in the pecking order right now. So absolutely everybody should have, have a say, but let's make it an appropriate say and make, let, let's make sure it's at the right place. Um, and also, let's, let's try and use that nuanced data, not saying that all the fish have disappeared. Uh, just going back to that as well, we talked about science and how, we, how we, communities can help. Our fishermen will tell you that the nets on the floor are finding the areas are, are 8 degrees for cod at the moment, round about where they're fishing. Cod won't survive in that, generally. 
and so they're moving forward, they're, they're moving up. Does that mean there's no fish? No, because we're seeing spur dog and blue, blue fin tuna coming into these areas. So it's about that reflexive science and how communities can have a, a voice and how they might change. And I would also, I also have to stress this about just transition. Some people are saying that they want to move away from particular types of fishing. I think fishing in moderation of all type, if it's well managed, is good. If you have too much of anything, you can have a problem. And that is the reality of the situation. But we must understand that if you whittle down the infrastructure to a point where there's no boats left, you won't build that back up. And I think in some areas, that's where we are. And we need to be mindful of that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Callum. Yeah, thank you. Um, completely agree with the need for just transition. Refer the committee to the shifting gears report that's in the SPICE uh, briefing for this. Um, we're with partner organisations. We're, we're setting out recommendations towards climate smart fishing and fishing action as climate action. Um, echo what Karen said about the climate emergency um, at sea. That's an ocean emergency. Uh, gave evidence to the Net Zero Committee recommending Scottish biodiversity strategy should be a nature emergency strategy, and the committee agreed. So we're in an ocean emergency here. Um, I completely agree the need for holistic spatial marine planning. Um, we're in this situation because it's taken too long to do it, but now we're running out of time. So we welcome the fact that the National Marine Plan has been committed to being updated. But that could take five years. We've got to turn this around by 2030. So I want to be a, a supportive voice for HPMAs. Um, I know everybody else is, and it's a question of how they sit in the ideal process. But the, the existing MPAs were really set up to protect the remnants. And I know a lot of those remnants because I've dived them, and citizen science divers have collected a lot of the evidence base for those, um, interestingly enough, including, including Loch Torridon. Um, it, the question of um, the, the imperative to do this, you know, we've, we've failed to meet good environmental status. Scot Scotland's main assessment couldn't be clearer. The biggest area of concern is the condition of the seabed. Um, OSPAR Commission talks about 86% of the assessed areas in the Greater North Sea and the Celtic Seas of physical disturbance from bottom contact fishing, of which 58% is highly disturbed. I think quite a good proxy for that in Scottish waters is the fan muscle aggregation in the Sand of Canna. It's the only place in the whole of Scotland you find these aggregations. They're highly, highly fragile, really large uh, uh, bivalve muscles, and, and they're extremely fragile to, to mobile gear. So that's why the only place you seem to get them in any numbers is where it's not pass possible for that gear to pass. Um, I don't see any of this lightly because I, I absolutely share everybody's view around this table to get sustainable fishing. We want to keep the lights on around the community. The Marine Conservation Society is all for sustainable seafood. Um, we want people to eat sustainable seafood long into the future. Um, um, and uh, the, just to answer the point about the percentages, that comes from um, the United Nations, it comes from the EU biodiversity strategy, and full disclosure here, we've put that in our ocean recovery plan. We say at least 30% of our sea should be highly protected, and at least a third of that should be uh, fully protected. And that's in line with best um, international science, as, as, as modulated through the recommendations from the UN and the EU. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, we, we, we're all wanting the same thing, and we need to do it holistically, and we need to do it together. We could bring in Sheila, and then Mercedes has got a, a question to close this topic. I'm sorry, I don't agree with Callum when he said everybody's for HPMAs. I think that's not true. Everybody's for sustainable fisheries. Um, HPMAs. We, we, I didn't say it's for HPMAs, but the, the end goal. <laughs> the end goal, yeah. yes, of what you hope HPMAs may deliver. Um, we already, if you, we already <laughs> probably have what HPMAs um, have, because not all areas are fished. Only 15% of Scottish inshore waters are fished. Only 4.7% of Shetland inshore waters are fished for um, for scallops. It's the same grounds again and again and again. It's not the same grounds. It's not the inshore waters all the time. It's the same grounds that are producing, are reproducing fish all the time. Now, again, Shetland's situation is slightly different to people around the room here. Um, fishermen are catching scallops, crabs, mackerel, cod, heron, not heron, sorry, um, haddock in inshore waters 
year after year after year after year after year, 98% of the cod under 10 metre um, quota is caught within Shetland waters. Now, there are, un there are fin fish f uh, uh, under 10 metre quota issued by Marine Scotland every year. I do not think all inshore fisheries are taking advantage of that. I would encourage them to take advantage of that, to prove that the fish is still there. Where you can, where you have the infrastructure, I realise it is not always possible. But because of this relationship we have in Shetland, we can do that. We, d we want to see other people succeeding because a competitive market is a good market. Um, the, um, there's a, yeah, I will leave it at that. Um, Mercedes. Thanks, Karina. Um, so we've heard about the importance of ecosystems which account for people as well as nature, and we've heard about declining stocks and loss of vessels. So given the impact that climate change is having on inshore fisheries, I'd be interested to hear from the panel, um, perhaps Charles could, could kick us off, any tangible things we can be doing to support and to promote low-impact fishing me methods um, to ensure that we have a just transition away from the high impact methods. Thank you. I mean, a lot of that, I think probably a lot of that your question has been answered already. I mean, in terms of uh, gear change uh, is, is important. That does not mean getting rid of all mobiles. Far from it. There's clearly a place for mobile gear. Um, but there is a question about how, to, how we look at this holistically, how we make a plan how we identify which areas should be allocated to which uses and uh, we sh how the HPMAs are designed. You know, there are, there's a, as I said, there's a playoff there. You know, large HPMAs potentially may be better for conservation purposes but worse for fisheries. Uh, so it is this amalgam and it is this need for this overarching, holistic and inclusive planning that I think is really the sort of um, top level answer, as it were, to your question at this stage. OK. Hey, Hannah and then Alistair. Um, yeah, I think the holistic planning is going to be really important. Um, I think also when we look at fisheries management, we're going to need to make it more flexible. We're seeing changes in the stock. We're going to be seeing a lot more of them because of how the waters warm up. And our management system, um, speaking from an Orkney perspective, just isn't up for fishing to be able to adapt to that. I also think if we look at transitioning to um, a just transition and low impact fishing, there's been a lot of talk of electrification of fishing vessels, which the industry in principle from the inshore, I think is generally very positive about, but there's a long way to go. The technology is not there. It's not off the shelf, but one big barrier for actually adopting that is how fishing boats are managed. So at the moment you have it essentially split into under tens and over tens, and that's created very, something we call super, um, super under 10s. So they're very, very powerful under 10 boats that are essentially built like a box. So they've got a huge engine, but they're not very streamlined. And if we ha and that's because of how we manage the fisheries into that under 10 category. And that is something that will make electrification really hard. So it's thinking about, it's really re-looking at the whole system of how we manage our fisheries and what we need to do to help create a positive change. So I don't think there's any big answer about what we can do, but there's going to be a lot of little small changes and those that are going to add up to make a huge change and to really help. Alistair. Um, apart from reiterating the words fisheries management plan, area-based fisheries management plan, again, um, you, you would ask, well, what, what would a fisheries management plan look like? And it would look like a, a move away from bottom-toed gear, trawling and dredging in the inshore, and a transition towards more static gear. Um, there would be far less seabed disturbance, far less fuel used, far less bycatch, um, far less carbon released from the seabed. The question then becomes, well, how do we do that, and how do we facilitate that? We have to create large, extensive static gear-only zones. We have to introduce management for that static gear to ensure it's sustainable from all sorts of perspective, from a catch effort perspective, from an entanglement perspective, and so on. And then we have to find mitigations for those mobile sector vessels who are going to bear the brunt of being squeezed out even further than the static gear guys. And, and, and that's where the just transition really comes in. We have to look at finding some way to fund these guys to either purchase static gear vessels or, 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 or adapt their vessels to static gear or, or take them out of the industry altogether. And this is the sad reality here is if the industry is over capacity, we either have to find some way to increase capacity, which it doesn't look like we're doing, or we have to decrease capacity. And then we have to find out where we decrease the capacity and, and, and who, who, who is going to bear the brunt of that. I think, I think we can increase employment 
in the fishing industry if we transition to, to static gears. Um, so there will be as many jobs, if not more jobs, as we go through this process. But we just have to make sure that, that, that we protect those people's livelihoods have invested in the trawl and dredge sectors who are going to bear the brunt of a transition towards lower impact fisheries. I, I think it's as simple as that. It's not really rocket science. We just, we just got to find out who the victims are going to be and make sure that they're not really victims, find a way to mitigate the impacts on them. Very briefly, Hannah. I was just going to say, I think Bally's point really shows the importance of local management and local just transition, because in, in Orkney, we essentially are just a static gear fishery. Most of our, we've got 110 vessels, most of them are static fishing gear. And we feel like that's a huge barrier to our ability to transition and to be more resilient, because people, they only fish static gear and they can only fish a few species. And that's impacting us. So I think that shows that there is no one size fits all solution. Um, I wish there was. OK, um, and Hannah. Uh, Elaine, beg your pardon. No problem at all. Um, yes, uh, just to pick up your point, um, Mercedes, you said about stocks disappearing and the position that we're in. Again, I'll go back to the fact that some stocks might not be doing so well, some stocks might be doing better. So it's about finding that science again that might allow people to diversify that neutral science. As I said, maybe bluefin tuna is coming into the Western Isles, maybe it's coming into the West Coast of Scotland, maybe that's something that we can look at. Um, the other thing I would say is, is obviously, I looked at the paper submissions and a lot of people have suggested that this transition that's going to happen is going to happen through philanthropic grants. I, I don't think that's likely. I think we're talking about a commercial sector. I think we're talking, but we're talking about family businesses. And I have never really experienced many philanthropic grants going to commercial businesses. And I think that's maybe people coming from a point of charity work or ENGO work and assuming that it can be transferred, it's very difficult to do. Um, I think what we also have to establish is the infrastructure is very much connected. Um, so it's, I represent, and I'm here from CIFA, I represent mostly static boats in CIFA, um, but, a connection, uh, but, but also mobile boats uh, in this capacity. They work together and we're not talking about big boats. And the big boats are, you know, the bigger boats are maybe 14 metres. You know, this is what we're talking about. And I think this false connection between one being against the other, I, we, I don't see it personally in the members that I work with. But I do, I keep saying that too much of any one thing can be a problem. And we're seeing that the static gear fishermen are under a lot of pressure in America because of right whales. And they're trying to stop the, the pot fishing and reduce the pot fishing because that's now an issue for them. What you have to do is balance. And I do think there's a lot we can do. Hannah talked about electrification. We put the strategy in before about what we'd like to do that. There's some people that are actually fitting converters onto their engines now. But what we have to know, it's in an ideal world, you might think that if you can pull one piece of the, the knitting out, that the rest will remain OK. It won't, because the markets don't always rely on the same things. So the trawl sector might be supplying a different market from the creole sector, etc. So if you take one chain out of that, you might see that the hauliers aren't working. Uh, and that then starts to affect you know, other, other sectors as well, because they all use the same infrastructure. So I think there has to be a real thinking about how you, you do that sensibly. I hope that the strategy that we put forward for our region is helpful, but I think it can apply to a lot of different regions and there will be nuances. Thank you. Uh, and a very, very brief question from Mr. Fairley. Question. Thank you, Convener. Alistair, I'm not sure if it's Alistair or Bali, so I apologise. Um, is to go back to the point that you made, you talked about overcapacity of trawlers in certain areas, and yet we know that there have been over 100,000 jobs that have been lost in the fishing industry in the last 30, 40 years. Sheila has been talking about losing infrastructure, losing critical mass of infrastructure. So where is the overcapacity of trawlers coming from? It is uh, proportional to the resource base. And so, for example, at one point there were 30,000 fishermen employed in Scotland in the herring fishing, and there's just there's barely 100 now. Um, so and much of the herring is gone from the west coast of Scotland. It is commercially extinct. I mean, there are still herring, don't get me wrong, but they are not in the quantities which would allow a viable herring fishing industry of any scale. So the fact that there are 30,000 less herring fishermen does not mean that there is a proportionate increase in the amount of herring. It's, it's the, the fishermen have shrunk proportional to the availability of the resource. And, and it's the same, same is true in, in, in the Nefrox troll. But there is also another element to this, is, is that a lot of these boats have been lost due to the economic factors like the price of the, the, the sell their shellfish for or the fuel costs and, and um, just because the vessels have disappeared doesn't mean to say that the resource 
has rebounded or, or it's there. I mean, it's a bit like when you cut down a forest with 100, 100 axemen and then now the forest is cut down. You only need one axeman to maintain it that way. And so this idea that because the fishing industry has shrunk, the, 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 the fish have, have, have rebounded hasn't happened yet. Um, we're just maintaining it at a very, very low ebb. Oh, right, that doesn't make sense to me. But anyway. I, I think Elaine wants to come in. <laughs> Could, yes, I mean, I think, again, we go back to the point about science. Um, we're not getting that reflexive science to show us what's actually there. Um, so it might be that there's a lot of herring in one particular area and there's not in another, but we won't know that. And, and I think this also ties to the quota debate um, and the opportunity to fish, because if you don't have any quota to fish a certain fish, you, you won't fish it. And some people are, you know, it, it, a lot of communities don't have the access to that anymore, and that's because of management systems. It may well change under the future fisheries management. But I'll give you an example. One of our fishermen wanted to go to, 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 to um, the herring fishery in Clyde, and he would have said that there was, there, there's plenty of herring there. They're seeing big marks. But if he wants to, to do that, because we don't have any local um, markets now, you would have to get a haulage truck to take it up to Peterhead, which would be over £2,000 a night to do that. If we had local processing facilities, there would be a market. So it's all connected. It's about the, the, the economic viability. But we've established earlier on that the science isn't there to inform this. So to say that the stocks are depleted, they may well be, but they may well not be. And that's why we, I, I certainly hear people saying all the time, there's a lot of this out there, but we can't do it. It's a diversification debate. I think I'm in on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're, we're, we're again further behind time. But I'm just going to ask a very quick question. <clears throat> And I'm not even going to give you the option to say yes or no. I just want to put your, you to put your hand up. So we've heard lots about plans and things. What's your opinion on whether we need an inshore fisheries bill? Hands up if you would support the introduction of an inshore fisheries bill. Okay, thank you. Um, we're, we're going to move on to the, the, the final theme um, on inshore fisheries governance and community empowerment. Mercedes. Yes. <clears throat> so, yeah, so um, debates, I think it's fair to say, over inshore fisheries management and conservation have become quite polarised. So part of the purpose of today's roundtable was to bring different groups together and find some common ground, um, which I think we have been able to do um, in some areas. Um, we've heard suggestions today that those with uh, a stake in an area should be brought in as statutory consultees on marine planning applications. So my question um, to the panel, perhaps we could start with Bali, is how, how can affected communities input their voice into inshore fisheries decision making? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think we have to start by recognising that, that everybody's a stakeholder. I see lots of debate on Twitter, actually, on this session about who genuine and real stakeholders are. And I think, I think the first and most fundamental thing is that the, the sea is one of the last great commons. It is the common heritage of all mankind, and locally it is the common heritage of the communities, communities that are adjacent to it. And therefore, it is the inheritance of our children. Therefore, everybody is a stakeholder. And I think that's, that's a fundamental point that has to be made right at the beginning. And once we've recognised that everybody is a stakeholder, then developing the forum that brings everybody in shouldn't be that hard. But the problem is, at the moment, the forums we have to debate ensure fisheries management are very exclusive. And they're, they're quite exclusive to the fishing industry. And so, therefore, like, like the IFGs, for example, can only bring in, in non-commercial non fishing interests by invitation. And, and often we hear of applications from non-commercial fishing interests to participate, and they're excluded. And also the decision-making processes that we have in the existing infrastructure like the IFGs are, are very opaque. And we don't know if it's by voting, by consensus. But generally what happens is, is the IFG doesn't achieve much, and then we ask Marine Scotland to interject, and they refuse if it's not supported by the, the, the wider industrial fishing lobby. And so I would say whatever the mechanism is, it doesn't really matter so long as it brings in that wider stakeholder group and allows them to participate in the process. Lucy. Thanks, yes, I agree with what uh, the points that um, Bal has made there. Um, essentially, you know, many community groups feel disenfranchised from the decision-making processes. We, we don't really have a mechanism by which we can actually um, really engage with the decision makers about decisions on fisheries management um, and you know this is as a community level um, and and sort of more widely with the regional seas so in terms of coming back to kind of like the idea of regional you know regional based management and spatial management that it has to be centered around the resource 
and everybody who is a stakeholder, which essentially anybody with an interest in the environment, should have a legitimate ability to have a to comment on and input into that decision making but it's got to look at the fundamental resource that underpins fisheries it, it, it just doesn't make sense to actually try and manage something that's extracting a biological resource without actually fundamentally looking at the resource and we have in in the communities um, network we have some groups that are actively involved in in restoring habitats, so things like seagrass and native oyster, and they're interested, the community as a whole wants to see better protective recovered in a healthy marine system that actually supports marine-based activities and enables community-based enterprise uh, and well-being. Uh, and we would like to see proper engagement, so if we had proper engagement, we could have this discussion about where such restoration can actually support sustainable, well-managed sustainable fisheries as part of, of the range of activity that takes place within the inshore area. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of potential that could be realised by actually having wider stakeholder interests fundamentally involved in the discussions around what happens with the future of our seas. But that process needs to be transparent, it needs to be properly constituted, uh, and we would suggest that any kind of management structure needs to not just look at fisheries in isolation, it needs to look at the wider environmental impacts and the requirements for protection and recovery within a regional area that then can support those, those fisheries. Um, Aline. Much. I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I, I outlined before, we used to have inshore fisheries conferences who any, anyone could come along and they, they could contribute and that would go into the Marine Scotland's policies as well. They would take that into account. We had FMAX, we have FMAX, and they were open to ENGO stakeholders as well as fishery stakeholders. The IFG is the only forum where various different types of fishermen and scales can get together and try and find some kind of consensus. So, as, as Hannah's pointed out, and uh, you know, I think we need to resource them better. But I do think we have to have a space where fishermen can decide when they take it into the wider policy forum. Um, there's consultation documents that go out in just about anything. In a recent consultation, I noticed in an FOI that um, somebody on Twitter had managed to kind of get the consultation reviewed, and it was extended. Um, so, they were from a community group, wider community group, and I think that that is. That's indicative that the voice is heard. You've got every consultation. You're, they're taking this on board. I, I think, to be honest with you, I counted up um, in my area alone the number of people who are probably not at the moment working with us in terms of fisheries management but are campaigning for certain things. Um, there's about upwards of 35 posts that are funded to the tune of 28,000 to about uh, £50,000. Um, so that's, that's 35 people plus, just in our region where I operate, who are lobbying for certain things in fisheries management. There's me and a few other fishing reps. So we don't have that resource, actually. We don't have that philanthropic resource to, to kind of get our voice across in, in the same way. So, I mean, I think there is definitely an imbalance, and it's definitely good to have a, a forum like this. But I don't think there isn't community involvement. I don't think there isn't an opportunity for people to have that. But I think post-COVID, post, um, we might want to think about how we bring those frameworks back in to make sure that everybody's happy. Thanks. Phil. Thank you. Um, we're looking for places where we agree. Uh, I agree with uh, what Elaine just said on uh, the need to reinstate IFMAC, FMAC, groups like that, which are uh, an open place where everyone can discuss things. Uh, Mercedes is, uh, sorry, Ms. Villa Alba's question was uh, about um, who should be included in these meetings. Um, my view is more people than uh, are currently involved. As I mentioned, we had this research boat, visited many ports, many communities around Scotland. I did a mop-up call, uh, mop-up meeting with the, the crew, and the first thing they said as a take-home message was, "There's a lot of people out there." who don't feel that they have a say over their local waters. And, you know, those people aren't on social media. Those people aren't employed to uh, be lobbyists. They don't feel that there's a forum for them. And when they try to raise things, for example, through the council, they find, I think Shetland's a great example where this isn't the case, because Shetland uh, fishermen uh, work with the council there a lot better, I think. But in many other cases, so try not to generalise, and so in many other cases, I think that the council, you know, aren't able to engage in some of those discussions as well. So my view is we need a big, uh, we need a broader engagement with these decision-making processes. And uh, without, um, you know, uh, wanting to talk about the RIFGs too much, but um, my understanding from speaking with active fishermen is that many don't feel that that's a, a safe place where they can actually raise their opinions and, and, and have a fair discussion about their priorities personally. So I don't feel that that is currently working in its current format. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Hannah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to maybe let Simon come back in on that or should I make my point anyway from the IFGs? Simon, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll swap it around a bit. That seems sensible. Uh, right. The, uh, the, the IFGs, uh, the network, uh, taking areas throughout Scotland. My own area is the west coast and goes from Cape Roth in the north to the English border in the Solway Firth, takes in the Firth of Clyde and all the uh, Inner Hebrides as well, accounts for actually about 62% of the entire coastline of the British Isles, so a very large area. Now, the, the, the purpose of the IFGs is the, to be the, is, is the preferred forum of Marine Scotland to work with the fishermen and bring the fishermen's issues to Marine Scotland and to any other organisation to try and get things done. It's there, it's for the fishermen, for every single <coughs> fisherman that, that, that's, that, that's at sea. Now, without the boats, we have no industry. But we're there to give a voice to that industry, to where it needs to be heard. So any fisherman can come to me on, on the West Coast and say, you know, I have this problem and I will deal with it. Now, I've been covering area to area just recently. Of course, we've had all the problems of lockdown with COVID uh, and market collapses and then Brexit and so on as well. But the, the, the uh, pandemic was a major one because everything stopped effectively. We couldn't go out and about. The, the advantage of COVID is the advent of the online, uh, on, online meetings such as Zoom and Teams and so on. And that's actually helped, helped to accelerate. But there are, are times when it, you have to do face to face. And Bali will tell you, recently I was uh, covering the northwest because my area is all divided into subgroups because you've got different, uh, d different needs from one area to the next. I mean, the Solway, very different to the northwest. So I inherited this job in, uh, in, in January 2020. And the subgroups that existed then was Solway, Firth of Clyde, Isle of Mull, and the northwest, which went re effectively Cape. Uh, Pardon American Point, right to Cape Roth, and took in Skye and, uh, and Rassi and the, the Summer Isles as well. Far too large an area to be managed because there were different needs uh, from Arden American to, uh, to, to, to about Al uh, and Loch uh, to from there further north to north of Loch Torridon, and then from there up to, to Cape Roth. So dividing the northwest into manageable subgroups where the fishermen can come to me and say, right, we have this issue here, we'd like to have this resolved, we'd like to develop our fishery this way, and that's fine. I'm there, I'm, I'm ready to do it. Now, the Clyde, for example, we, we've started a project there for, uh, for, for, for creel management, which will become a multifaceted uh, project as well, covering all different areas, and will cover the mobile section as well as the static section, because they have to be inclusive in this. And uh, originally, the idea was it was going to have from, uh, from, from Cape Roth down to uh, the north of Loch Torridon, and then the next group from there down to Ardenmarken Point. But at the meeting, I was at in Kyle McHarsh and Bally was there and it was, became very clear that uh, the, the area where, where, where Bally, Bally operates, which is from uh, really north of, of Loch Torridon uh, down to Isle Orancy and Nice Point and Skye, had some very, very dif different issues to just south of there and to the north of there. So I, f I thought, fine, okay, this you know, necessitates having a subgroup to cover that area. It's for the fishermen, and I want it to be led by the fishermen because it's their business, it's their livelihood, it's their children's livelihood in the future, and you know, and I want that livelihood to go on. We want to deal with all the issues, with the spatial squeeze as best we can, and let the fishermen have their voice and have their say. That's what I'm here for. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thanks. I think. I think I definitely echo a lot of people have said about transparency and the importance of how people use that to engage in the process. I think also having trust and accountability is also incredibly important. So having clear pathways of how we know when you um, put in your opinions or your thoughts, whether you as an individual or as a group, where they go to and what the process is, how they get incorporated and how they get weighed up against other experiences or other evidence. 
I think that's very important and it's not always something that I think is clearly defined in our current processes. I think one of the issues about community empowerment, especially when we talk about the inshore, is just the fact that it's such a huge topic. I mean, at the moment we've been speaking about inshore fisheries, but we'll also be talking about conservation, about aquaculture, about seabirds. So I think there's always going to be a huge problem in empowering people to have these conversations because with these conversations there's no start point and there's no end point either. Um, I think the IFGs are incredibly important to fishing and I think it's really important that we have that dedicated um, set of groups for fishers. And I think that if they should be, they should be transparent. But I think that having that dedicated space is really important. And I think that if there is a need for that for other groups as well to have their own dedicated spaces, that's something that should be looked at. But I think the IFGs should remain as they are for fishermen. OK, thanks. I'm going to bring in Lucy and then Charles. Thanks. I think it's perfectly reasonable for, the, obviously, there to be for a with which fishermen come together and actually are talking with policymakers. The issue comes where other stakeholders whose interests, legitimate interests, and un, in many cases businesses, are affected by decisions around fisheries management, which sometimes can be poor decisions, which have affected, directly affected communities. And as it stands, there is no social licence in the current, current governance arrangements for fisheries management because it excludes the public from actually having a say in how that resource is used and allocated. Um, and there's an example from Aaron where we used to have a very prolific angling festival um, that was a big event on the island and brought lots of revenue into the, uh, into the area and involved people involved in the uh, recreational and commercial sea angling sector. That stopped at the end of the 90s because there were no more fish for the anglers to catch. Um, and whilst it may be disputed as to the reasons for that, the opening up of the inshore areas to trawl fisheries in the 1980s allowed impacts from the more impacting sectors of the fishing industry, and, and this is documented in scientific evidence, the relative impacts of different fishing, fishing activities, has affected the, the inshore areas, and, and communities are at the receiving end of that. So it is imperative that people whose other livelihoods and interests are affected by these decisions have a say in what actually happens in their local marine and coastal areas. Hey, Charles. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the interesting thing about the IFGs in a way is that they've, they've kind of evolved. I mean, they were initially established, whatever, 15, 20 years ago now, to develop management plans and to do so in a transparent way. And they have become less inclusive. They have become much more of a forum for the fisheries. And that is, um, f and from that is uh, policy is produced, and or policy advice is produced. And that's fine. If that's what they have turned into, OK, so be it. That's good. It's good that the fish fishing industry can have that um, gathering. But what is still needed is that wider forum uh, where the different stakeholders in the inshore can come together and actually influence. And that, that perhaps, you know, it's, it's not a perfect model, but it's interesting to see what happens south of the border of the inshore fishery conservation um, authorities, the IFCAs, these regional groups which have bylaws, uh, powers, they have constitutions, they have multi-stakeholder uh, participants, and as a result, you get a much better um, mechanism for implementing ecosystem-based management, which takes fisheries out of a silo and manages it in a coherent way with the in, uh, environmental interests taken into account, along with all the others of the inshore. And so I think that, if the, so to sort of recap, the IFG is fine. If they have become the kind of mechanism for the industry to talk together, that's great. But there needs to be something else as well, which is wider. We, we, we must finish at 11.30, so we've got uh, Callum and then Alistair, uh, Simon and then Sheila. Okay, thank you. Um, very sympathetic to what, what's been said about the, the importance of um, in, inclusivity. Uh, so just for uh, transparency, I mean, we said that in our written response, and then we said that to the future fisheries management uh, discussion response as well, that I mean, what we said was we support proposals for strengthening IFGs, including extending to 12 nautical miles, which would improve integration with regional marine planning, provided they are adequately resourced and there is improved representation for all stakeholders. So we, are, we do have that concern about these, um, 
to make sure that these processes are inclusive of other interests, the, 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 the other social and environmental interests. And um, just to echo with what Charles said, we highlighted in our written response as well the, the value of the IFCAs um, in England. And there was a study done that showed, one study highlighted there were 12 stakeholder groups were members of IFCA committees or boards compared to only two for the IFGs. And I know it's not, I know it's not like for like, but that's the issue. So what we need to have is inclusive, effective, transparent inshore fisheries management. Okay, Alistair. Our experience of the IFGs has been very poor. As a forum where fishermen can come to chat, I think it's an excellent forum, but as a management uh, mechanism, it's, it's terrible. Um, for example, uh, the meeting Simon mentioned in my community uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we have uh, over 100 vessels registered at Portree Fisheries Office, only three people turned up for the IFG meeting. Um, and that's because there's a huge loss of faith and the, the IFG is a practical mechanism to progress fisheries management. Um, for example, over 10 years ago, the IFGs drafted management plans um, right at the top of these management plans. And I think this was true for, for all the IFGs around Scotland, was um, spatial management and effort controls. Now, these management plans have never been progressed. There is no spatial management being introduced and there have been no effort controls introduced. And so as such, we've, we've lost a, a huge opportunity. The, the management plans of the IFGs have not been implemented and there isn't a plan to implement them or a plan to, to develop the plan any further. Um, locally, the, fishies, the IFGs are known as the place where fisheries management goes to die. Um, and uh, Marine Scotland sends every initiative that we send them to the IFGs. They say, take it to the IFG, and we take it to the IFG, and if the IFG doesn't achieve consensus, We've asked Marine Scotland regularly, what do we do in the, in the circumstances where the IFG doesn't achieve consensus? And they say, you can ask the IFG to recommend it back to us. On several instances, we've written to the IFG and asked them to recommend, for example, the, the herring spawn enclosure that we wanted north of Gairloch, because the, uh, a new herring spawning ground had been identified. It was on Blue Planet. It was a big, it was a big thing. And uh, we took the IFG and we said, IT's advice is that we should protect the spawning habitat of the herring where it's been identified. And there was no consensus within the IFG. Um, ICE's advice would say we close it to mobile gear, but the mobile gear sector said we're only willing to agree this if the static gear sector are also excluded, which one is out with the scientific advice, and two, the, the local community are far more dependent, the static gear community, than the, the mobile community who, who infrequently visit there. Because there was no consensus, we asked Marine Scotland to make a determination, and Marine Scotland have not done this. This is just one example out of many. Our local community overwhelmingly voted for an inshore fisheries pilot, um, where we managed static gear and, and, uh, and mobile gear separately, and uh, it had, had the support of 100% of the full-time fishers within our community. That's over 35 boats fishing in the inner sound. It wasn't supported by the half a dozen visiting trawlers, and as such, no progress has been made over, over the 10 years or so in the three iterations of that pilot. So from our experience, IFGs are, are, are non-functional. There needs to be a mechanism to make sure the IFGs do their job and Marine Scotland aren't fulfilling that. Okay, um, very briefly, Simon. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I'll come to points made uh, about uh, the, the uh, coastal communities as well, having a voice through, through the IFG, which were brought by, um, by Lucy and by Charles. I am willing to listen to anybody and everybody that comes to me with an issue which affects fisheries. I sit on the uh, Clyde Marine Planning Partnership as well, and so we'd get a lot of that interaction. And I take some of that interaction back where it's necessary to present to, to Marine Scotland as well with the case. I mean, I put a report up each time I have a meeting as such. So I am willing to listen to any coastal community because I live in a coastal community myself, so I, you know, it, it's close to my heart. So I'm there for that. Coming to... Uh, to, to Bally's points as well, uh, yes, I apologise for the fact that uh, we couldn't get out and about and do anything because of COVID. Uh, but since COVID and lockdown and everything has, has ended, I have made the effort. I've come out and about. I wanted to have a representative from Marine Scotland with me for it as well, to put the Marine Scotland perspective. And so I had to wait until we could get somebody clear to do it. So that was the earliest opportunity I had. And I got to the meeting, uh, day before we'd had the meeting in Ullapool, there were about 25 people there. Some travelled quite a long way. I got to Kyle and I, somebody had said, oh, Bally is going to be here because he's going to represent all the fishers in the area. So I thought, fine, okay. So that we, you know, we talked to you. I think the, the direction of our travel of, of discussion was to you as well, because you were obviously selected to represent the fishers as far as I was made aware. 
so it was directed to you. And I think we made it quite clear that our role was really quite a consultative role from the fishermen to take all the information to Marine Scotland as, as all, we also have to take that information from Marine Scotland back to the fishers as well. And I will keep chipping away on the herring spawning bit there. I have made numerous representations to Marine Scotland just uh, on that point to try and get things expedited and get things moving. I also have similar issues with the Solway, with the cockles. I've had projects knocking back and forward like a tennis bat. Very briefly. The point I was making about only three fishermen turned up. Yes, I agree. I, I was representing the local community, um, almost 100% of whom are members of the Scottish Gear Fishermen's Federation. My point was that no other fisheries representative turned up. Nobody from the Troll community or from the Dredge community or from Malig um, Fishermen's Association or Clyde Fishermen's Association or Western Isles Fishermen's Association. As such, we were left. We could debate all day. We could, we could come up with a plan and, and then it would go back out and just be dingied by everybody else. It's a kind of, it was a bit of a waste of our time. That was my point. Okay. So it was in their area. Okay, um, Sheila. Um, as Phil said, it seems like a long time ago, this discussion, um, the regional marine plan in Shetland, again, Shetland is leading the way in regional marine planning. Um, the document is currently with Marine Scotland. It's been sitting there for a very long time, waiting for ratification. We'd like to get it back and get on with implementation of it. But what, what it did include was proper proper discussion between all interested parties, members of the community, interest, anybody interested in, in the parties was involved in that marine planning. But what it did also include was that anybody involved set out clearly the criteria of why they wanted to be involved in the management process in terms of who they represented, their aims and objectives, their governance and transparency to, regarding funding, etc. And I think that is imperative when community groups, people who say they have a social interest are involved in fisheries management. They must be clear and transparent about what their aims and objectives are. Um, the inference around the room seems to be that um, these uh, other interests that parties need to be involved to secure um, healthy ecosystems and healthy stocks. Fishermen want that. It's the very thing that they want. It, to, to give the inference that fishermen, without including these groups, that won't be an achievable aim, is, um, it's quite catastrophic to think that that is true. Um, what we are finding is that the tie-up of marine resources in Marine Scotland and in, in associations through FOI requests, judicial reviews and all of this is stopping progress within, within inshore fisheries. Um, we currently have the RFIG system. It's not just ENGOs, etc., are kept out of the discussions, to be honest. We have no representation of fin fish catchers in Shetland on any RFIG, something that I've brought to Jim Watson's point, and he said that associations will not be on RFIGs, full stop. He is looking at it, but not at the moment. That's, that, that's quite, that, that means that basically fishermen have no say. Um, RFIGs currently, well, when we wrote this document, um, the budget for RFIGs was £200,000. IFCAS is £9 million. So um, you can't compare apples and pears when you compare RFG and IFCAS. It's two different things. But what it does point out, that if you're going to properly manage inshore fisheries, it needs resources. You need to manage the expectation of what the government is promising for inshore fisheries and other people that are in the room today. Um, or else we'll just pick holes in each other and never get anything achieved. In the light of declining resources, I think that is probably a closing point, manage expectation. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you all spending that extra uh, 35 minutes. We could probably be here all day and all week. Um, it certainly gave us uh, plenty of food for thought. So th thank you, particularly those who have travelled some distance to be here with us today. Um, uh, we will reflect on the discussions today and uh, no doubt we'll, we'll return to some of the topics that uh, have been raised and issues that have been raised at uh, uh, future meetings. So thank you very much. I'll now suspend this minute, uh, meeting for 15 minutes. Thank you.
They had pastries. Uh, welcome back. Our final item of business today is consideration of a consent notification relating to the cytosanitary condition amendment number three regulation uh, 2022 and I refer members to paper two. Do any members have any comments on the notification? Mercedes. Thanks, convener. Um, the reclassification of blueberry rust from the list of quarantine pests to the list of regulated non-quarantine pests suggests to me that controls on this pest have been ineffective as it's moved from a pest which is largely absent from a territory to one which is already present in a territory with measures in place to minimise its spread. So I'd be interested to know um, to, or to receive any data on the rising prevalence of this pest and any analysis of what has led to its spread and also to hear what steps the relevant ministers and governments are taking to control and eradicate it. Okay, thank you. Um, what, what I suggest is if members are content to, uh, uh, to, to agree to this uh, uh, notification, we, we can also write to, to ask for some more information on, on the topic you raised. Okay, are, are members content? Thank you. Um, that concludes our business today. Thank you. And I formally close this meeting.